Okay, so good morning. It's great to see so many of you here today. And actually, uh, my colleague at the front was saying there's lots of people that I don't recognize, which I think is brilliant because uh, it's really nice to be able to open up this event to uh, a wide range of uh, different people. So welcome to the John Lennon Centre Conference Centre. This is our accessible science event. It's something that we've been running annually since 2016. Um, and it was originally uh, for our staff, uh, research and support staff at the John Lennon Centre and the Sainsbury Laboratory uh, as a day of accessible science to find out about the work going on across the institutes ahead of our annual science meeting. So an opportunity for our staff to ask questions in a slightly less intimidating atmosphere than our annual science meeting. This year, we're welcoming staff from all four of the bio institutes on the research park. So welcome to John and his staff, uh, the Sainsbury Laboratory staff, Earlham Institute for the first time, welcome, and Quadrum Institute. And we're also uh, joined today in person by some very smart looking uh, young people over there from City College Norwich. So they're doing their T-levels in laboratory science. So it's really exciting that you can come and join us here today. Okay, so this event has been sponsored. Oh, before I say that actually, so during the pandemic, we actually went online for the first time um, and that gave us an opportunity to open up these talks to schools as well. And over the years, um, we've got more and more schools joining us. So I think today we've got 15 schools uh, joining us today, eight universities for the first time, as well as other people as well. So it's great to be able to open it up to, uh, to those people as well. So welcome to those of you joining us online. Today's event has been sponsored by the John Lennon Centre and the Technician's Commitment. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Technician's Commitment, this is a collaborative um, initiative between universities and research institutes very much to uh, collectively raise the visibility of uh, roles and individuals uh, um, working in science, uh, making sure that they get the recognition for the work that they do, as well as career development and sustainability, because it's really important that we attract uh, new talent uh, to take on these sort of scientific uh, roles to, to, to help us with our science. So thank you to the Technician's Equipment for sponsoring this event, and I'm gonna show you a very short video from them. And I have to admit, each time it makes me feel quite emotional because, you know, without the people that are here today, the science that we deliver from the research part just wouldn't happen. So for those of you not familiar uh, with us, we are part of the Norwich Research Park. So we're based on the east side of England, about an hour away from Cambridge. And we're home to uh, the John Innes Centre, which is a plant and microbial research centre. We've got the Sainsbury Laboratory, which has a focus on plant health. We've got the Earlham Institute, which is a genomics and synthetic biology uh, uh, institute. And then we've got the Quadrum, which focuses on uh, food and health. And they've got a particular interest in how the food that we eat affects our gut's microbiome. And actually a really nice fact that uh, comes up when, when I've heard uh, talks from Quadrum is there are more things living on and in us than there are cells of our own body. 
So it's really important that we feed uh, those things the right things because they play a crucial part in our, um, our physical and mental well-being. We're also home to the University of East Anglia as well and the Norfolk and Norwich uh, Teaching Hospital. Uh, we're also home to over 40 companies as well. So we've got uh, companies like Leaf Systems, Colorifics, and Tropic Bioscience. So we're very much this hub of um, engineering biology uh, here on the Norwich Research Park. So some, some images of some of the buildings. So Quadrum is probably one of the newest buildings we've got here. Uh, this is photographed from the hospital side. So it's a view that perhaps a lot of you haven't seen before. Um, and it's an amazing building. So if you get the opportunity to go and have a look at it, do go in. On the basement is uh, home to the UK's largest endoscopy unit. So they see about 40,000 uh, patients a year. They've got clinical research facilities there as well. And then upstairs, they've got these uh, rather impressive uh, labs as well. And we've got the Elm Institute, this uh, rather nice uh, red looking building here. Uh, and they're uh, at the moment sort of decoding all of life. So they're doing some really impressive big genomics work there. And if you think our ability to sequence genomes has really dramatically increased over the last 20 years. So 20 years ago, the first human genome was sequenced and it took about a decade. It involved multiple labs across the world and millions of pounds. And we can now sequence a genome within a day. So this technology is, is really advancing uh, our understanding of, of living systems. Now, not to be outshone by Quadrum and the Earlham Institute, this is the vision for the new John Innes and uh, Sainsbury Laboratory building. So this is a 350 million pound investment. So building work is due to start next year on, on the glass houses. Um, and it's expected to finish by around about 2022. So some of you joining us today uh, may end up working here as well. We're calling this HP3, which stands for Healthy Plants, Healthy Planets, Healthy People. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to this building opening. So that's enough of the introductions, onto the fun stuff. So today we're gonna to be hearing talks from all of our institutes here today. So we're gonna start off this morning with short talks from the Earlham Institute, the St. Louis Laboratory and the Quadrum. And then we've got a chance for some Q&A after that. Then we're gonna have some flash talks by some of our research and support staff. And then we're gonna stop for lunch. So we've got a two hour lunch break, which might seem excessive, but this gives an opportunity for some of our staff to rush off empty autoclaves, go and water plants. Um, and for the rest of you, you know, I really hope that you do get involved in, in having a look at some of the displays that we've got on, on offer um, and do some networking as well. I know for most of you, the idea of networking probably fills you with complete dread, uh, but it's a really useful skill to have. So on your name badges, you've all been asked to put three things about yourself. So use these as icebreakers. Uh, go up and talk to somebody and, and ask them you know, where they're from uh, and, and, and what they do or what they're interested in. So the first one on mine is that I've been here for 29 years. I originally came to do a four year PhD and then never left. So uh, that's one of my facts on there. Um, we've also got posters up from some of our staff who took part in this year's Herschel Women in Technical Leadership training. Um, so this is a six month training program. Uh, and the call for um, next year has just gone out. So if that's something that you're interested in, if you're a woman and you're in a technical role and you fancy a bit of leadership training, then that could be for you. Uh, Emma Waters from QIB has also bought her display, uh, I'm a Scientist, and this is one that she displayed at the Norwich Science Festival. And this shows a range of sort of diversity of people um, and some of the jobs that uh, go on here across the research park. After lunch, we'll come back, we'll start off with some flash talks again, and then we go on to, uh, we've got one of our PhD students, uh, Josh, who will be speaking after that. And then we go on to our keynote speaker, who I'm really excited uh, to hear from today. And he's someone that I met for the first time at the Norwich Science Festival and um, talked him into coming to speak for us uh, this afternoon. So without further ado, I pass you on to Monica Chetri, who will be chairing this morning's session and introducing our first speaker. Thank you. Good morning and welcome all for coming. It's very exciting. We have got four uh, main speakers from four different research institutes. Each speaker would be given uh, 30 minutes for the talk. Uh, 25 minutes is the talk time and five minutes, uh, some lovely questions coming from the audience. Please feel free to ask questions because we would also be getting questions from the school through the Zoom link and we would like to give them some time 
to get the questions coming in. So please free, feel free to ask any questions. And if you have got any technical questions that you would like to ask, the speakers would be available during the lunchtime and they would be more than happy to answer your very technical questions. And yes, so I welcome Anita Schoon. She is a postdoctoral research scientist in the Macaulay Group at the Earlham Institute. And her primary area of expertise lies in the technical development and implementation of advanced omic approaches for single cell sequencing. Without wasting more time, uh, Anita Schoon, the stage is yours. Thank you. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Everyone okay? Cool. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. I think this is a really cool event. It's the first time I'm taking part of an event like this. Um, and I think it's a really cool thing that we get to share the science that we do to people that might not have a science background. And I think that that's more important really than sharing it to the scientists that do this all the time. So um, as she said, my name is Anita Schoons. I'm a postdoc. Um, I've just completed my PhD at the Earlham Institute. And today I'll be giving you a talk about single cell sequencing. You will hear me say the word single cell about a thousand times in this talk, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, and I'm gonna be talking to you about single cells in the context of the blood system. Um, if you point cool. Um, so today's talk, I thought I'd start out with quite a broad introduction as to cells as the basic fundamental units of life. Um, I will then go through what the different, how do we actually define what a cell type is? Um, and I'll specifically focus on the blood system. Um, I'll then give you quite a deep insight into single cell genomics in terms of what it is, um, how we do it, why do we do it, especially why we do it, because I think that that's the most important thing that I want you guys to get from the talk today. Um, and then I've only got two or three slides on actually what I did in my PhD. Because uh, I thought, I'll, if not, I'll yabber on for about a, an hour about my PhD. So I'm just going to give you a really broad overview of, of the work that we do in our group. Um, so as I said, cells are the fundamental universal building blocks of life. They are the smallest living thing that exists. Um, and here I've got lots of different pictures of cells, single cells. Um, and you can see they're very different. You've got very different looking cells. They're different shapes. They have, ex especially they have very different functions. Um, but universally, they connect all living things because if you go back ancest ancestrally, um, they, we all come from a same single cell, a same single common ancestor, which I find fascinating. So despite all of this diversity that you can see here, you can see a blastocyst, which is a developing embryo, you can see cells that line what's called a crypt, which exists in our intestine. You can see here the root of a plant. This is composed of lots of different single cells. The, these are pollen granules, which aren't necessarily cells. Some people consider them cells because they technically have nuclei, but this is how um, sperm cells from different plants are transported. Um, you can see bacteria and you can see lots of different blood cells. Essentially, what I wanted to get across with this slide is that they are the fundamental units of life and they connect all living things. Um, and even though she rightly said that, of course, we have many more bacteria and other species living inside of us, we actually have a tremendous amount of cells in our bodies. Um, as humans, uh, an adult human being will have 37 trillion cells in their body. And if you compare that to galaxies in the observable universe or stars in the Milky Way, that's an astonishing amount of cells in just one human being, which I find fascinating. So I always like to keep this slide in. And if we break that down in terms of what cell types these are, you can see the vast majority of cells are our erythrocytes, which are red blood cells that carry the oxygen in our body. If you then sum that up with platelets and other bone marrow cells, you'll see that about 90% of the cells in our body just sustain our blood system. And the rest of them, so our muscle cells, our hepatocytes and our liver, your fat cells, everything else makes up a really tiny percentage of the actual total cells in your body. Um, I always just like to stick this fact in because just to put that into perspective, in this talk alone that I'm giving, which is hopefully going to be 25 minutes, you will be generating about 4.2 billion red blood cells. So if you don't get anything from this talk, if you find it really boring and a waste of your time, you are still being productive because you're generating 4.2 billion <laughs> red blood cells. So take that away with you today. Um, but what do I actually mean when I say cell type? We know that we have lots of different cells, but we know that those cells are separated into types. 
And the way that I like to explain this is if we think about the genome, which is the collection of information that we have in our DNA that encodes all of our genet genetic material, let's think about it as a library where the library is our genome and each book in that library or each zone represents our genes. And if you think about things in terms of two very different cells, let's think about a brain cell and a muscle cell, right? Which is a neuron and a myocyte. They are very different. They have very different functions. So out of this genetic information, out of this whole library, it wouldn't really make sense for both of these cells to look at all of the information. So if you think about a brain cell, it would probably be interested in reading things like Shakespeare, maybe Charles Darwin for some creativity. It would like to know some world history. It would like to know some words so that it can construct, uh, construct phrases, uh, make sentences. Um, a muscle cell might not benefit from those genes or those books in particular. A muscle cell would probably benefit more from looking at something like Get Jacked magazine, right? Uh, how to make your cells bigger, how to make them stronger, how to get the energy needed in order to make your muscles work and your movement uh, to happen. So that's how I like to explain the concept of you've got different cells that express different genes that essentially enable them to best function. Um, and although we've got all of these different cells, inside of our tissues, which compose our organs, which is what makes up us as humans or any living being. Um, I like to think about it also as each cell has a unique function, just like instruments, right? So you've got your, your strings family, your brass family. I know nothing about instruments, but the idea <laughs> is that you've got different instruments that look very different. They sound very different. They also work very differently but they must work together in order to produce a symphony. You cannot have a beautiful piece of music if you've got the trumpets going really loudly and the drums being completely quiet. Everything must work together and in synchrony in order to produce a symphony in the same way your cells must work together in order to produce a functioning tissue. Um, now I'm gonna zone in a little bit more in the hematopoietic system. The hematopoietic system, essentially what that big fancy word means, it's your blood system, right? It comes from two Greek words, which means hema for blood and poesis, which means to produce something. So essentially it is how our blood is produced. Um, and it, all of the details here aren't super important, but these are the main cells that could like make up the blood system. Um, they all, interestingly, derive from stem cells that exist within our bone marrow. So these are specifically hematopoietic stem cells, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next slide. But these cells are responsible for generating all the different cells that exist in our blood that broadly can be split into two categories. You've got your white blood cells that are involved in your um, immune responses, so like your T and B cells that are involved in responding to stimuli such as bacteria, viruses, anything like that. Um, and then you've got your red blood cells and platelets, which are, of course, what transports the oxygen in our body and supports our vascular system and prevents excessive bleeding. Um, and the way that I like to think, going back to the analogy of the symphony, is that stem cells are the orchestrators of this process. Stem cells are really unique and powerful cells in that they are um, long living. So unlike many other blood cells that turn over, which die and are regenerated, stem cells survive with an individual most of the time throughout their lifetime, which is a powerful feat in itself. But the two really differentiating uh, features of stem cells is that they are multipotent, which means that A, they are able to differentiate or become other cells, right? That specifically multipotent in this case means they are able to generate any type of blood cell, not any type of other cell in your body. They cannot generate fat cells, for example. They are multipotent, not totipotent, but they are very powerful cells. Um, and interestingly, they are also able to self-renew. So stem cells aren't only able to generate the progeny or the daughter cells that generate your blood cells, but they are able to generate more stem cells. Um, and this is a really powerful thing that is used in stem cell therapies. And that's why they are uh, sort of a big focus of research and have been since I think the sixties when they were first discovered and everything. Um, and 
as I said, I, was, I said I'd go into a little bit more detail about stem cells. And what I'd like to essentially enforce here is that stem cells are one of the few types of cells that are able to make decisions. They're not necessarily cognitive decisions that we humans are able to make, but they are three different avenues other than dying, because that happens too, but um, three different avenues that a stem cell can take. A stem cell can decide to remain what's called quiescent, which means it will just stay in a dormant state. It will just stay happily in the bone marrow, sleeping away, not really doing much, maybe sustaining other cells around it, but not actively dividing or replicating or doing anything like that. You can also have stem cells that go through a process of self-renewal, where stem cells will divide and generate two daughter stem cells. Or, ooh, ooh, or <laughs> um, a stem cell can go through the process of differentiation, which means that as it's dividing, it's generating different types of cells. Uh, and in this case, they would be generating more mature blood cells. Right, um, And there are many, many factors that influence this process. This isn't a uh, vacuum system where the stem cell is just going to become what it's supposed to become. Um, but um, the things that mainly affect this is signals from the environment. So there will be uh, cytokines, which are just chemical signals that are released between cells that will help govern that cell to divide in a certain direction. Um, or things like injury or disease. So for example, if you have an infection, your stem cell might receive signals. That means, okay, it's time to generate some more B and T cells to respond to this threat. Um, and then it might divide that way um, in order to generate the numbers of cells necessary to respond to that, uh, that stimulus. Um, Age also is a big uh, factor in stem cells because stem cells uh, don't stay the same throughout our lifetimes. They work more efficiently as we're young. Uh, as we age, they are less efficient at what they do. And also, as I said earlier, because they're long living, they are able to, over a human's lifetime, accumulate mutations in the DNA. And sometimes it's actually the stem cells that have been able to accumulate in the human with mutations that is the cause of some cancers that arise in humans. So that's why another reason why they are big focus of research. Uh, but the first one you'll see here is what factors really affect this is what genes the cell is expressing. Um, so now that I've given you a broad overview of cells, what they are, um, hematopoiesis as a whole, and stem cells, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a closer view into what single cell biology is and why we work with single cells, right? Um, going back to the analogy, what is single cell genomics? Well, single cell genomics is the idea that uh, rather than looking at the whole picture, rather than looking at the whole tissue or listening to a piece of music where it's quite difficult to dissect or actually hear the specific instruments and what their contributions are and how different they are when they're played together, you go through the process of ap appreciating each solo musician one at a, at a time. So you essentially isolate single cells and extract the genetic information from single cells rather than a tissue as a whole. What does that mean in an experiment? So let's think of a tissue, in my case, bone marrow. That's what I'm interested in studying. Um, there are two approaches you could do, and two approaches are readily used to understand what genes are expressed, what is the genetic information that is expressed in the cells within the bone marrow. In a traditional or like a bulk, it was referred to as a bulk approach, you would take the bone marrow, you would then chop it up essentially, and you would extract the genetic information, extract the DNA and prepare it for sequencing, where you then get from the DNA sequencer, what is the sequence, what is the, the order of genes, what is being expressed, right? Um, in the case of single cell preparation is the same process, but before going through the process of generating your sequencing material, your genetic material, you isolate each individual single cell, usually, for example, in wells of a little plate. So it's a little plate with lots of little holes or little wells where you isolate each individual single cell and you extract the DNA from each single cell. And the point of this is that you're then getting a readout, you're getting the information from things at the in the context of where it's being expressed, not just a whole tissue. And here you can see here, the result of this would be one sample and you could see the gene expression levels, whereas here 
you'd have your four different cells that you've isolated, and you could see the gene expression levels for each of those cells. I, I thought I'd break this figure down a little bit more because this is the really important point I wanted to emphasize and what the power of single cell research really is. Um, because essentially it's the only way that you can really study each cell's unique gene expression pattern in the context in which that cell exists. So if you were to look at the results from the bulk sequencing, you would see that you get, you know, your, your, you can see here each gene, let's say each gene is one of these colors. You can see you've detected four genes. You can see the relative abundance of those genes, um, but that's as much information as you can get. It's good information. You can see what's present in your sample, but that's as far as you can get. If you've done it at single cell level, however, you can immediately see that there are big differences from the exact same sample. This is obviously just an illustration, but this is what it's like in seeing your actual data. You can see that cell one and two, even though they express the same genes, cell two expresses a lower level of those genes. That would have a big impact in how that cell is functioning. Not only that, but cells three and four, which were more rare in the sample, have actually, you can see that this one expresses a gene, gene yellow, let's call it, which is completely missed in this example, or the, this cell expresses two genes that were completely missed, whereas you can see that all cells express this purple gene. So you can see which genes are expressed globally across cells and which genes uh, vary. So this is just a really powerful technique that allows you to identify the unique expression profiles of, um, of each individual cell and study especially rare cell types like, like stem cells and rare genes that may have been previously missed in other experiments. And, and the impact of this into life outside of just research alone is massive. Um, not only will this allow you to discover potentially new genes or new functions of genes or even potentially new cell states that have been previously masked by the fact that they were averaged together in a single experiment, but you can use this information to better understand diseases. You can isolate single cells from a tumor, for example, and try to understand which single cell is actually expressing genes that might be related to resistance to a certain type of therapy. So this is massive, it has a massive impact into disease understanding. Also in regenerative medicine, I'm sure some people have heard of uh, stem cell therapy, where patients' stem cells are able to be extracted extracted, and then engineered in a certain way in order to cope with whatever threats they have in their system. And it's also really interesting for personalized medicine because everybody, it allows you not only to get a deeper understanding, but a deeper understanding of things at the personal level, um, which allows you to really dissect which cells are governing uh, the biological processes that are happening inside of us. Um, so this is really the, the point I wanted to get across is that single cell is a really powerful technique that allows you to truly get the heterogeneity or what is the variety of the genetic information that is within a system that might have been previously missed in other experiments. Um, and then just for the last few slides, I thought I'd show you a little bit of information about what I did in my PhD, just in case some people are interested. Um, obviously, I was interested. <laughs> I did it for four years. So um, what I studied was uh, the process of this stem cell commitment, which is the process in which a cell decides its fate, decides what cell it's going to differentiate into. Um, and specifically, I was interested in the platelet lineage. And what do I mean by this? Well, if I break down the original photo of, or the uh, uh, schematic of hematopoiesis, the process is actually really complex. Um, and here you can see just the hierarchy or the process of differentiation for just the platelet lineage, right? So the end, end result here are platelets. As I said, they originate from stem cells and they go through these commitment stages where they divide and become increasingly restricted to become a platelet, which means so cells down here are no longer able to generate other types of cells, whereas cells up here still have the potential to become your B cells, your T cells, for example. So the process of differentiation involves a stem cell through a multipotent progenitor, a myeloid progenitor, a megakaryocyte erythroid progenitor, and then your megakaryocyte. Long story, it's a process, okay? <laughs> and then, um, and 
what are platelets? Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, platelets are essentially the bandage cells of the body, right? They are able to respond to uh, lesions in your blood vessels and are responsible for blood clotting. So not only are they responsible for your bruises and your scabs, but inside there are micro cuts that are happening inside of us as blood is traveling through our system all of the time. And platelets are responsible for bandaging up and sticking to those vessels to prevent internal bleeding. That's their main function. They are derived from cells that are called megakaryocytes, which essentially means big nucleus cell. Uh, which are comparatively to other cells in our bone marrow, they are massive. They are, I think, up to 100 microns, uh, which is, I think, 10 times bigger than the other types of cells that we have in our blood system. Um, and they are unique in that we have uh, um, what's called a, a big nucleus, essentially, where instead of going through the process of cell division, where you get two cells, the cell actually goes through an endo replication where the nucleus divides, but it stays within the same cell. So you just get this massive cell called a megakaryocyte, and then little parts of the membrane of the outside of it buds off and makes these little platelets, which are tiny little cells, which don't have a nucleus. They are, their only function is to be able to stick to the vessels and respond to stimulus. Um, and my objective here was to study what are the changes that are happening at the gene expression level, whoops, at the gene expression level that is governing this commitment process. What are the changes driving the, the commitment from stem cell to megakaryocyte and eventually platelets? So I did a lot of experiments, um, essentially involving isolating bone marrow, isolating then single cells from bone marrow, extracting the genetic information for that and proceeding with sequencing obtaining genetic information for each individual cell throughout this process. And I haven't got that much data to show you because I didn't think that you'd benefit that much from it. But this is one of the really cool uh, data, data plots that I generated in my PhD. Um, this is called a UMAP plot. The detail isn't uh, important, but this is basically a two-dimensional representation of some results. Each dot here is genetic information from a single cell. So each dot represents a single cell. Each, uh, how closely together these dots are, the more similar the cells are, the further away the dots are from each other, the more genetically different or distinct they are from one another. And what I've done is I've colored these based on um, there, there's an algorithm that allows you to what's called cluster cells, which means it basically looks at the distance between each little dot and it says, right, I think that that's one cell type. I think that that's another cell type. I think that's another cell type based on just the genetic information alone. Um, and what I've, I, what you can see here is that I've, from my experiments, I've looked at the genetic information and I've captured stem cells, the progenitors, the further downstream progenitors and the megakaryocyte and erythroprogenitors. The details aren't important, but this is essentially a representation of how similar or distinct those cells are from one another. And what this enables you to do is to start looking at the expression level of specific genes across these cells. This is as much detail as I want you to take away from it, is essentially here, I've shown you just a few examples. This is the same plot repeated nine times, but here you can see uh, an expression level for each of these genes. There's nine genes in total. Here you can see these three genes are highly expressed in stem cells, which is over here. Then you've got MPL and VWF. These are two different genes that you can see are more broadly expressed throughout different populations. So this is a really powerful approach where you can not only study the, which cells you've captured and get information about them in that respect, but you can also look at what the different levels of gene expression is to try and understand which genes are responsible for the specific cell types. Um, so in summary, uh, cells, as I said, can be defined um, by which genes that are expressed as part of the DNA blueprint. Um, the blood system is composed of many cell types, with each with unique functions to sustain life. For example, megakaryocytes generate platelets. Um, 
the 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 the, the field of single cell biology is a really powerful uh, approach to really dissect information that might have been previously missed from these vast genome sequencing experiments because you're putting things in the context of the cells in which are expressing those genes. Rather than getting the whole library, you are trying to dissect, okay, but this is what that cell needs. This is what that cell needs. And that is really important for us to understand how the cells work and consequently how the tissues work and generally how we function as humans. Um, and this has ramifications in many areas of biology, but especially things such as the develop development of new therapies um, and, and stem cell therapies. And I think that's everything I wanted to talk about. So thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been interesting. I hope I've also not gone over time um, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you. Certainly not. <laughs> You're exactly on time. Oh, that was very fascinating to see that how the expression of a single cell could vary from the expression of the tissue that it yeah. makes. Right. We are open for questions. Any questions? So just out of curiosity, um, how hard is it to do single cell transcriptomics or gene expression studies compared to bulk studies? Like what extra equipment do you need or costs mm -hmm. or time, Good et cetera? Question. Very good question. Um, in terms of how hard it is, it's never been easier in a way because the, the technology has come a really long way. The first single cell methods kind of came out in 2009, 2010. Um, and it started out with very small experiments where you would have to do isolation of single cells through specialist equipment like a fluorescence, um, it's called a fax, a fluorescence activated cell sorting equipment. So there is definitely a lot of additional costs with these experiments where you need to have fax equipment and things like that. There's also more higher throughput where you can process more samples at the same time, uh, rather than in, I, individually isolating the cells. You basically put in an instrument that does that for you, but those are very, very expensive. It's called like 10X Genomics is the name of one of these companies. Um, it's complex, but the process, the workflow of these experiments is the same. You are isolating your cell, you are getting the genetic material out. The only difference is that you have to amplify the DNA more, because if you think about the amount of DNA you have in a tissue versus in a single cell, you don't have enough of it just to load it into a sequencer straight away. So you have to go through additional method steps, but other than that is the same process, just a bit more expensive. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, not a biologist here. Um, I was blown away by the amount of blood cells. Um, it, is that how do we, how do they all fit in us? Are they way smaller than all the other cells? I, I couldn't work it out in my head. Yeah, no, red blood cells are tiny, tiny, tiny. But um, but not only that, uh, but they die very quickly, so they don't live in us for very long. So we at any one time we have them in our system. Um, but they don't have a very long lifespan. So they die off and then they are generated more, I think. Actually, there's a really cool fact, if I remember it correctly, that um, if you were to consider how many blood cells you make in your lifetime, so you specifically, how many blood cells you make in your lifetime, not just right now, you would make enough blood to give to 200 people, as in 200 people's worth of blood would be just from you in, in your lifetime. So it's a really, it's a, it's a fascinating system. They are tiny cells. They trans, they go throughout us all the time to transfer oxygen. Um, and they kind of, their shape is also very good in terms of um, getting them to transport around us. They're kind of in this kind of disc kind of shape, which means they can travel around and fit more of them more easily, essentially. But uh, I don't actually know how they fit. Well, I don't know. <laughs> and how, oh, I forgot what my question was. It's gone. Um, <laughs> What happens when they die? Do they get recycled? They do. So essentially, it's a process where um, the other cells uh, as part of our blood system, so cells in um, kind of the more immune side that I, I showed in that hierarchy, they essentially, we've got certain cells that respond to infections, but some cells basically just gobble them up and they just get degraded inside those cells. And then the proteins and anything else that is part of those cells just gets released again and, and used to make more. That is essentially the process. That's as much detail as I know, to be honest. I don't know that much. Yeah, we've got a question that's come in from one of the students at Wyndham College, I think. Um, how can you use the information you have found to make personalized medicine? Ooh, good question. Um, so for example, I'm trying to think of 
a, a reasonable example because it's still in its early phases. It's important to emphasize that personalized medicine, um, it's not there yet. It's it's far from being there in some ways, but we've also never been closer. But um, understanding the differences of uh, the gene the, the genes that are being expressed in our cells, it gives us the information in terms of how those cells are functioning. So if I was to get two people and sequence their information um, at the bulk level, it might come out that some of that information, uh, it kind of equalizes between different people. Not necessarily in all cases, it's important to, to emphasize that, but in the case of single cell, you can do what's called single cell transplantation assays. You can do single cell experiments where you put single cells in a Petri dish and then test different um, reag uh, agents on them, different chemical agents and see how they respond. And in that way, you're getting cells from a patient and really studying how they are responding to specific therapies. Um, and it's just a step closer to getting more information about the patient to be able to design the specific therapy needed for that person. I hope that that makes sense. Okay, one more question coming in online. Mm -hmm. Is cloning humans or animals possible by stem cells? Oh God, <laughs> um, good question. This is not my area of expertise. And uh, if you try and clone a human from a blood stem cell, no, I wanna say, <laughs> but um, I think it's, I generally don't know how to answer that question. Uh, there, there is cloning happening with, I think Dolly the sheep was cloned, I don't know how many years ago, so it's possible to do cloning. Um, it's not the area of my research. I haven't cloned any humans at, at this time. <laughs> Maybe one day, who knows? But um, yeah, I think there is possibilities. They look at it, but uh, it's not my area. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Anita. That was very, very interesting talk. Please give it a big hand. Right. Our, our next speaker is Professor Sophie Nkamun, who grew up in Tunisia, studied genetics in Paris and Davis, California, when working in Wageningen, Ohio and Norwich. I think he's traveled all around the world and he's known for his seminal contributions to our understanding of plant diseases and plant immunity. And Sophie's inventive work in plant pathology has resulted in new approaches to mitigate some of the world's most serious crop diseases. So I'll hand over to Sophia now. Thank you, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to talk to a diverse audience like this. So thank you for joining and thank you for having me um, speak to you. And um, we'll, we'll switch gears now and talk about plants. So I work at the Science B Lab. The Science B Lab is an institute that focuses on plant diseases, plant pathology, as we like to call our field. So we work on both the plant immunity because plants fight off diseases, and pathogens, and also we work on the microbes and various critters that infect plants. But before we talk about that, I'm just going to tell you something a little bit more personal. And I'm just going to take you back in time and space 30 years ago, Australia. I love Australia. I'm a biologist, so I grew up really loving natural history, you know, David Attenborough and all of that. So I really wanted to go to Australia for a long time. And I decided to do that 30 years ago with Saskia, who many of you know. So this is a uh, younger version of Saskia, who is a group leader here at the John Innes. And um, uh, she, I think she spoke to this group a few years back. And so uh, 30 years ago, um, we uh, just got ourselves uh, a very uh, clunky, rusty Ford Falcon. Uh, she's uh, the type of car that's uh, very, uh, resilient to the Australian outback. We got ourselves a tent and we just drove 35,000 kilometers. I think it was about seven flat tires. I'm incapable of changing a flat tire, so Saskia was doing it, but uh, that was that was one of the uh, sort of things I learned at that trip. So why were you there? Why we, We're not just there for tourism. We were there to uh, basically do science, do biology, and we were there to chase insects. And the joke very quickly became is we uh, went to Australia to chase after insects, but it turned out that the insects were chasing after us, as you can see here. Uh, so no, we were not actually looking for this kind of insects. They were actually after us, but we were looking for this type of insects. This is a tiger beetle. And we spent those six months chasing after beetles. I see Kelsey there applauding. Um, a lovely, absolutely lovely, beautiful insect. That's a photo I took in uh, Western Australia. And uh, those, uh, the outcome of that trip was this publication, which described 
uh, a very diverse group of tiger beetles. Many of them became flightless. So if you like, they're kind of the ostriches of, uh, of, of beetles and, and, and got bigger and they got very, 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 very fast to the point that they're actually the fastest running insects in the world. So it's fastest insects. And that, that just got picked up after that little paper we had after that six month trip get picked up by uh, by the media and all of that. These guys are run like over 100 uh, body length per second. It's twice as fast as a cockroach. You must have seen cockroaches running. These guys are much faster. All right, why am I telling you all of this? I don't know why. I just decided to start the story this way. Uh, I just love that time when uh, we were just uh, young and free and driving around and doing biology for fun. I think that inspires some of you to, to do some of that. Just grab some binoculars, whatever. And, or butterfly net and just go and, and get in the wild if you like. And Australia has many strange animals, uh, not just those beetles. Uh, you've been familiar, I think, to some of these. There's also, uh, you have to be careful, some of those animals will uh, go after you. I think Australia has three animals that will hunt humans as prey, uh, uh, saltwater crocodile, the great white shark, and all of that. Uh, anyways, but Australia has also some amazing plants. So this is a shot again, that sort of old style cameras uh, shot from those uh, 30 years ago. And there's this majestic eucalyptus, the gum trees, as they like to call them, absolutely stunning, really uh, very, um, very fitting for that uh, dramatic Australian outback. But there is also another plant in Australia. And this is why I I'm, uh, I'm started talking about Australia, because this plant has been absolutely instrumental in my career. Uh, this plant made my career, really, my research scientific career. This plant, known as Nicotiana bentamiana. Nicotiana is the genus that includes also the common tobacco. The, uh, tobacco is that, uh, you know, that plant that we make stuff with that you should not be smoking, right? Uh, so uh, anyway, this is a cousin of Nicotiana bentamiana, of Nicotiana tobacco, the tobacco, um, that people shouldn't smoke and and uh benthi as we like to call it because we love it and uh you know the aussies they like to give nicknames to everything and uh shorten them so we like to call it benthi in the lab uh benthi is 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 a plant that lives in the australian outback but we like it for other reasons we like it we love it actually because of this method called agro infiltration so agro infiltration is a method that was developed also about 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And it's basically taking one of those benthi plants and infiltrating it, infiltrating a little panel there of the leaf with a bacterium called agrobacterium. And what that does, it allows the plant to express any gene you want. So if you just splice that agrobacterium with a given gene, you can now use this system to very quickly do uh, gene expression in the plant using uh, agrobacterium as delivery method. And that allows you to do all kinds of stuff, all kinds of research. You can express proteins, you can make mutants, see what, what kind of phenotypes they give, you can do cell biology, and all type of research can be done by this. The reason why this method is important is not because we can transform plants. We know how to transform plants. We can use agrobacterium to transform any plant. And uh, some of the folks here work with Arabidopsis. We have a lot of jokes about Arabidopsis, but you could do also transformation of Arabidopsis. It just takes you weeks, if not months. This can be done in just a few days. We have Friday. Next Friday will be another infiltration day, we call it in the lab. So we call Friday's infiltration day, and the folks will prepare some agro, go to the glass houses, infiltrate uh, Benthi, and by Monday or Tuesday, after the weekend, they'll have the result of their experiment. And this is really important in science because in science, the way we function is we generate hypotheses, right? You have an idea, you have a crazy idea, right? Uh, I don't know, this gene does that. Like this gene makes the plant resistant to a pathogen, let's say. And if that experiment, then you test the, then you design an experiment to test that hypothesis. But if that experiment takes you six months, your experimental cycle is too slow. You will not be making as many discoveries as if, as if that experimental cycle will take just a few days or a week, right? So if you can do experiments faster in just a few days, your experimental cycle would be shorter and you'll be able to test a lot more hypotheses. And hopefully one of those hypotheses will actually turn out to be correct. And they rarely do. Uh, and, and then you'll make some really cool discoveries. And this is why Bentlamiana has been so instrumental in my career because it enabled me 
to shorten, dramatically shorten the experimental cycle. And I have to say that some of my colleagues just couldn't see that. They just stuck to their model system. They spent months and months doing experiments. Whereas I could just test a lot more hypothesis in my lab using this particular method. And that allowed us to move really, really fast with the science. Okay, a little bit of some technical stuff. I think some of you would want to know a little bit the details. So agrobacterium is a natural plant pathogen. It has a piece of DNA called the TI plasmid. And that blue bit there in the TI plasmid is what the bacterium naturally transfers into plant chromosome. This is how the bacterium causes disease. It's able to do that, transfer a piece of its DNA into plant genome. So what um, plant biologists have figured out is that if they remove a, some of the blue stuff, put a gene, a pink gene of interest, then what the bacterium will do, it will actually transfer that pink gene into uh, the plant genome. And this is used to transform plants. This is how we make genetically modified plants. And normally you use tissue culture and then regenerate the whole plant uh, that will be carrying that pink gene. So this process here of, um, of, of making the transformation is what's very slow. This takes weeks, if not months. So the idea with agroinfiltration is we combine the agro uh, transformation, but instead of those two steps of regenerating whole plant, which will take a long time and requires tissue culture and so on, is slow, etc., we use infiltration. We use an infiltration method, and that's where this syringe infiltration of a leaf comes into play, because then we can infiltrate that little area, and just within a couple of days, that piece of infiltrated leaf will be expressing the gene, that pink gene I showed you. Unfortunately, the video is not going to work. I had a video of, uh, of the agroinfiltration, but you can find it in, uh, in my blog. I just tweeted it moments ago. So if you go to Kamun Lab, the Twitter feed, you'll find a link to the video. It's on YouTube. So uh, those of you who are interested in following up will find it there. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, the main point here is because of this method, Benthi became really popular. And just like articles here talking about the rise and rise of Benthi. So what can we do with Benthi? Okay. One of the things that my colleague, George Lomanosov, for example, at the John Innes has been a pioneer of is use Benthi uh, essentially for producing useful compounds, for example, pharmacological compounds or even vaccines. All right. And we have a company here called Lift. Leaf systems, which is basically derived from this technology of using benthial for, uh, as we like to say in our technical uh, jargon, biofarming, right? And uh, for example, benthi is used also for uh, producing uh, vaccines against the flu or vaccine against COVID. Uh, this is actually, some of you re remember her, uh, Ali McLean, she's a, an alumnus of the John Innes. And as a parenthesis, we're very proud of the people who leave our institutes and go on to have wonderful careers uh, abroad. Ali went to Ottawa and she's been pioneering uh, developing uh, Benthi as a way of producing uh, a vaccine against uh, COVID and, and other, uh, other plant uh, diseases. So that's one application. Uh, but the application that I use, I'm plant biologist, I don't do vaccine stuff. But uh, the application that I use is actually goes back to Anita's talk because Anita told you about genomics, how genomics is so transformative. So when I started becoming an independent research scientist, had my own lab, I, uh, that was the time when genomics became really accessible. So what is genomics? Basically, like Anita told you, is reading the book of life, right? So if you take a plant or a pathogen and you sequence the genome, basically now you have a long collection of genes uh, and, and, and really, the challenge is not having the genes anymore. So that's not the challenge anymore. It's not finding the genes. It's knowing what these genes do, right? And now we have thousands of them. So it's not easy. It's not an easy challenge. And this is what we like to say, a new way of doing business in that in the old days, before genomics, the problem was finding the gene. Now we have all the genes, but we just need to find out what they do. And that's where Benthi is actually really useful because it allows you to go from this part list, if you like, it's like having a catalog with all the genes and trying to basically connect that to uh, processes, uh, mechanisms, and all of that, and see which genes are working with each other and, and this type of things. That's where Benthi is absolutely fantastic in allowing us to do that. So that's kind of what this reflects. You can start with a collection of genes. These days, we can synthesize them. There's ways of synthesizing DNA and synthesizing the genes, dropping them into your agro vector and then expressing them in plants and then do all kinds of uh, assays looking for an immune response. This is actually how the plant 
when the plant is defending itself against pathogen, does that kind of immune response. You can do biochemistry, look at the proteins themselves, you can do cell biology and so on. So this pipeline really is what enabled my lab to actually have an impact in this field by discovering all kinds of functions to uh, genes that were not known uh, prior to that. Okay, just a little bit few slides that are maybe more um, illustrating some of this stuff. One of the things we can do is find genes that make the plants resistant against disease. This is actually the potato blight. This is the Irish potato famine pathogen. It's a very nasty disease of potato, but this pathogen happen, happens to also infect Bentley, because Bentley is a cousin of potato, believe it or not, tobacco and potato are kind of distant cousins, if you like. But if we take a gene from a wild potato and put it in Bentley, uh, then you can see how uh, now the pathogen is enabled to infect that plant and you get that immune response blocking the pathogen right there. Another thing we can do is to find which pathogen genes are actually activating this response, this immune response in the plant. And we can do from pre-acute screens where we use toothpick inoculation now on, on our Bentley plants and see which of the pathogen genes. So this is the part list of a pathogen and which of them will induce the defense response and which ones don't. And that, that allowed us to discover virulence genes from the pathogens, from the potato blight uh, microbe that are actually activating immunity, and therefore we can understand now how the coevolution is going on, etc. We can also do cell biology. This is what uh, some of the folks in my lab have developed about 10 years ago or so. Uh, they all went on to have their own labs. Uh, Togia Boskurt at Imperial College, Sebastian Schoenack in Cambridge, uh, and so on, there, Yasin Dagdas in Vienna, and uh, they all uh, were involved in developing this method. This red uh, thread here, you see, is the microbe itself. That's uh, a thread of the potato blight. And it forms these protrusions here that are going inside the plant cell. That's how the pathogen is feeding and infecting the plant. And what these guys do, they use actually fusions uh, to uh, plant proteins. They fuse them with fluorescent proteins. The, actually, this is a bit crazy experiment because the fluorescent proteins, some of them come from jellyfish, for example, but they happen to be naturally fluorescent. If you expose them with a laser, they'll be fluorescent in yellow or in red, etc. And now you can visualize what's going on. So you can see this plant protein that's yellow is at the membrane, uh, but uh, it's also accumulating around the site of infection of the microbe. And, and is involved in fighting off that, that pathogen. So that's uh, one other way we can use Benthi to, to study these, these kind of systems. Uh, and I'll, I'll maybe go fast around this. This was also an animation, but this is actually plant immunity when it's activated. These are some of the sensors that plants have to say, hey, there's a pathogen here. When it's activated, they make all these little dots, these little puncta, as we like to call them, that accumulate at the membrane and also accumulate at the site of infection by the pathogens. So some really cool stuff we can we can do. Oh, this video is working. Ah, oh, magic. Uh, and I forgot to give you your glasses, Penny. Now I realize you, you didn't see anything. Sorry, I had some housekeeping thing, and Penny told me to give her glasses. Now I realize she couldn't see any, any of the slides. Uh, I'll have to redo the talk, so sorry about that. Um, OK, uh, I should have reminded. <laughs> Anyways. More recently, sorry, this is getting a little bit technical, but I just, I can never, never um, hesitate in sharing the most exciting thing going on in the lab right now. The most exciting thing going on in the lab right now is we're using Benthi to produce protein complexes that we can give to Jake, Jake Richardson, and our colleagues at the uh, EM uh, facility here in the John Innes, and, and, and let them basically figure out the structure of those proteins using EM. So we're calling this IPEM, Sorry, jargon, but basically we're still using Benthi as a factory to produce protein complexes, drop them on an electron microscope, and these days you can actually figure out the structure of those proteins, uh, not just how the cell looks like, but go really, really deep at that. And this is something, again, that is made possible by our beloved Benthi. Okay, I'm just going to finish there, uh, just to tell you that sort of uh, framing what I've been telling you about is our institute is... Um, Generously funded, actually, by David Sensbury, Lord Sensbury's um, charity, the Gatsby Foundation. So we've been created uh, in the late 80s to do curiosity-driven research. So we do curiosity-driven research. We do whatever the heck we want to do with that generous funding we, we get. Uh, but we decided about a dozen years ago that we should also 
be engaged in translational research. What's the difference? Translational research is actually driven by problems, solving problems, not by the scientist's curiosity. But we realize that this is all, all a wheel. It's all working together. It doesn't matter whether you're doing the research because of your own curiosity, whether you just like, you know, go to Australia, grab, grab a car and drive around, look for beaters, or whether you're trying to help a farmer solve a problem, discoveries come from all of this stuff and they're all feeding in each other. So we have this TSL plus concept, which is a problem driven type research, but we also have something we like to call gained in translation because sometimes we do problem driven research and we inadvertently discover something that's really, really cool and feeding back into the basic research. So uh, a shout out to my colleagues, um, Mark Chase, Sandy Knapp. These are all botanists, plant biologists who do a lot of curiosity driven research. Mark is actually the expert of the wild tobaccos of Australia. He goes there. This is actually Benthi and it's in the wild in Australia, not in the lab, like we've never seen it before, I guess. And uh, Sandy is, is, is an absolutely lovely person uh, at the Natural History Museum in London. And, and I just, even though I'm a molecular biologist by profession, I share a lot with them because we both love DNA, we love evolution, and we love biodiversity. So my message, especially to the young folks here, if you want to be a biologist, don't neglect any of these three areas. You have to pay attention to DNA evolution and biodiversity. And biodiversity is so important in this day and age because of this, right? Because 2019, a few years ago, Saskia and I decided to have an anniversary trip to Australia. We went there, we went to this bird watching hotspot. Guess what? The whole thing was dry. The whole river, one of the largest rivers of Australia was totally dry. It's just not a drop of water. There's not a single bird there. There's nothing. It's all gone. And that was one of the most depressing moments of my life, actually. And Australia is one of the places, not the only one, that's being really hit by climate change. So these are really issues that imagine the consequences, right? You lose biodiversity, you lose modern systems like Benthi. It affects farmers, it affects real problems because it affects the research. So we really need to pay attention to all of these issues globally and not neglect any of them. So thank you, that's all. And if you like the talk, then there's more on the, on the blog. So check the Medium blog, okay? So thank you so much. Thank you, Sophie. That was really interesting. And I'm glad that potato separated uh, from the Koshiana a long time ago in evolution. Thank Otherwise, you. McDonald's would be doomed then, I think. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Just don't smoke it, okay? <laughs> yes, yes. Any, any questions? Uh, we've got a question come in from one of the students at Wyndham College. How was the plant discovered to have these properties? Oh, okay. Uh, accidental, actually. Totally accidental. So the reason why Benthi was in the lab, I'm pretty much every plant pathology lab had Benthi in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And that's because it's from the desert in Australia and somehow became very susceptible to viruses. There's probably not a lot of viruses infecting it in that very dry, arid environment of Australia. And so plant virologists loved it. So uh, everybody in the lab had the stock of benthi going. And, and when people came up with this agroinfiltration idea, they start probably infiltrating whatever was in the greenhouse. And somehow benthi was there for completely different reasons. And it turned out to be very uh, amenable to that assay and, and, and very reliable and robust. Because that's another aspect of it. I mean, you can do this agroinfiltration in many plants, but benthi is very reliable and robust. And that's very important in science, right? You don't want to um, have a plan that is sort of, sort of an assay that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. So the reason we like it, it's very robust. So an accident, another accident of, of scientific research. There's a lot of those. Any more questions? Um, is there any like um, other plants like Benthi that are being researched into and looked at currently? Of course, of course. I mean, one of the things that actually genomics did, uh, going back again to Anita's talk and the fact that we can sequence genomes and all of that, I like to also say genomics is the big equalizer. So in a way, modern systems are not as important as they used to be. In the old days, it was difficult to sequence the genome. So Arabidopsis is the one of the major models in plant biology. But you know, that was the first plant genome to be sequenced. So then people were really working on Arabidopsis or working on rice as an example of a different group of plants. Uh, so, um, uh, but actually these days, um, because genomics is so easy as we heard, 
Uh, Penny also mentioned that you can sequence the genome in a day now, uh, plant genome. So, so then that's kind of an equalizer because really, if you want to be a biologist today, you need to have a genome, right, of the organism you're studying. So, I would say maybe my answer to you is that there are many, many systems uh, these days. If you want to just let your curiosity go wild, and if you find a plant that's understudied, maybe cactus, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that would be a fun plant to study, right? There's not a lot of research on cactus. So think about it, like all the amazing adaptations that cactus have. Right, any more questions? Right. One question, Sofian, because yeah. uh, lots of people are uh, doing research on ben Benthamiana. Mm -hmm. There are, are any uh, collaborators, networks, uh, resources available for those researchers? Oh, that's an excellent, outstanding question and such a, a limiting factor, but unfortunately the funding is not there for that, sadly. I mean, even the Arabidopsis resources, Arabidopsis has been the major sort of model system again in plant biology. Even that has been struggling to have like communal global um, networks uh, of supporting sending seeds and mutants and stuff like that. In Bentley, we don't have that. And that's, there's really no, no easy way to get funded for that. So um, yeah, that's another problem. So plant funding, funding the research is, is uh, funding this type of resources is, is really hard to get. Yeah, yeah, maybe in future. Sadly. We've got yep. one more question coming. Yeah, Penny, I think, had a question. Right. It just came to me. I've seen you advertise these things called pre-docs. Yep. Can you explain what those are? Pre-docs, okay, yeah. There's uh, an article on the blog about that somewhere there. Uh, pre-docs is basically a bit like a master's program, let's say, but without getting a degree, right? So um, we, uh, we like to host students for uh, periods of usually about 12 months. Uh, where they're actually doing research before starting a PhD. My my personal opinion is I think too many students uh, rush into the PhD program without really experiencing a true research experience before. It's tough to do research. It requires certain character, certain personality, being able to deal with failure. I mean, like I told you, you know, most hypotheses don't work. So you got to be really tough and resilient and stubborn and patient and all of that. Uh, and so, so the pre-doc is our way of... Um, trying to sort of get the students to be experienced to the real research experience before um, starting their PhD. So um, it's, it's normally what the master's program would do, um, but this is much more focused on research. So, yeah, we've had kids like that from all over the world uh, join us for pre-docs. It's been great fun, actually. Right. Thank you so much, Sofian. That was really wonderful. Oh, we have got, have you got one more question? Sorry. Right, yes, another question coming in um, from, I can't see who it's from, but <laughs> might be Marcantia polymorpha. Oh, Can be words. one of the models. Yeah, of course, liverworts, amazing. So that's an, actually going back to your question, uh, Marcantia is a liverwort, so that's a bryophyte. Bryophyte are like the early diverging land plants. So when land plants when plants moved to Earth, it's about 450 million years ago. They were marine. They were in the uh, marine environment, right? And plants moved to Earth about 450 million years ago. Uh, they didn't actually produce seeds or flowers or anything like that. And there's a branch of the plant sort of kingdom, uh, the bryophytes, that um, stay like that. They they didn't evolve. Um, the flowering and all of that. So they're distinct from all the flowering plants like Bentley, Arabidopsis, cotton, and so on. Uh, so, uh, and that's in the recent years, people realized like if we really want to understand plants, we have to study those guys too. We can just study Arabidopsis and Bentley and that's it. So, so there is actually a community now that has developed, uh, including scientists here at the John Innes, uh, studying. Uh, bryophytes, liverworts, for example, Marcantia polymorpha, and that's really giving us a much wider and much broader view and perspective of plant biology than sort of really being focused on just a few uh, flowering uh, species. And so that's, I think that's where the question comes back. And that takes us again to that issue of biodiversity. If you call yourself plant scientist, you can just say, I study Arabidopsis, I know everything. You have to understand that there's just a lot more to plant biology than just one single model species. Yeah, thank you so much, Sofin. That was really good. Uh, please give him a big hand. <laughs>
Now, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Anna Victoria Guterres, uh, who is a research scientist in Quadrum Institute. And she would be talking about the detours to triumphs, embracing my zigzag career path in science, which we all need. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Um, I will do a talk um, changing topics quite drastically from what has been uh, the scientific um, content of the last two speakers. This is gonna be more or less like the example of uh, what Sophie has speak about the note. Um, but my journey has been 15 years to land to where I am now. I will start by where I'm from. I'm from Venezuela, which is a beautiful place. I have a lot of landscape that I'm very proud of, but this beautiful doesn't extend to our economical. We are very separated from well-developed areas. Um, probably. We have very different areas, well-developed, rich people, and we have extreme poverty, where is more or less where I grew up. One advantage of my country is education is free, which you might think, um, yes, please. I should have done the fabric. All right. Maybe just bear with me a second. Put this. This should do better. Thank you. I found the laser. You might think because the education is free in my country, I had the chance to study whatever I wanted. Um, actually, I wanted to be a psychologist. I was fascinated about the mind and research about the brain and how it works. But unfortunately, that courses were not uh, available in my city and I was a minor aged, So my parents would not let me go to a different city. So I had to just change a path. And from that path, it was more or less trying to find courses will allow me to understand what I wanted to do for my future. I started my first classes in going to pharmacy. I did a small course of six months. Um, and I say, well, it's maybe not my thing. Maybe I should do something else. And one day, a friend of the family told me, maybe you should do biomedical science. And I don't know where this came from because I never show interest in doing science at all, apart from understanding the brain. But I didn't see it as science. And I decided to go into that journey. This picture I have here is the first day in university that we had um, lab experience. You maybe cannot gather um, the faces and the expression of that time because by that time the cameras were really um, no great quality but everybody was lost we actually burned the clots of the of the lab on that day uh, we got some burnings from some acid as well um, but that's not happening anymore uh, <laughs> in the lab that I'm working um, but very likely on the first day that you go into a lab you will burn something or yourself that improved for sure, during, during the following months and years, uh, being on the university and learning. And one day I decided, well, maybe I should find a job. Um, and that is how I apply my first studies. And I went to this chain of pharmacies called Pharmato, um, which is like a boots in here. And I lasted only three months there because I, I was working like midnight shift, thinking that I was done, I can't do it all. I quit the and I say, well, let's keep the career going. I was not really finding it. Um, so I was constantly trying to find alternative things to do to find my place and to feel pleased. I went to a different job, still studying and doing a job. And I went to work as an assistant in a surgeon room where you just give supplies. And actually this job was a key moment, pivotal moment to understand about passion, understand about how you can care about someone and find it useful for someone else. But this time I got to meet nurses and surgeons and patients, and I found I wanna do something for people. Maybe with my career, I will be able to do it. At the time I finished, I was quite disappointed and heartbroken. Um, 
because for great fortune now we are moving towards technology using robotics and diagnostics require using robotics to go fast and, and give a diagnosis brief, um, accurate and, and reproducible. And I was just finding so disappointment in maybe I will just be sitting in front of a robot my whole life, just putting a sample in, printing a report, and that's it. I was heartbroken. I wouldn't say the press, uh, but I was heartbroken. Um, and then I found a job advertisement just at the moment I was just graduating that say, no experience need. Um, you want to work doing diagnosis of tuberculosis. I have learned in university how to diagnose um, viruses, um, infections in tissues, how to measure the amount of red blood cells that you had in your body, but never tuberculosis. And I went there. Actually, this job was in the Amazonian jungle, and it has been the best experience of my life. I was there only for seven months, but during those seven months, I could travel for rivers, I could travel to the skies, and I will feel useful to the indigenous communities that I, I will be delivering treatment and diagnostics. During this time, I've realized this is what I want to do for me. I want to help people. And I want to use research because part of this job was to, part of this job was to understand when the disease are rising, how we give treatment, which treatment is useful and not. But with the knowledge I had and when how naive I was back in that time, I realized I need to study a, li a little bit more. I got excellent people along the way guiding me. What can I study? And they told me do microbiology, and I went for a master. And that started my journey in science. I was doing experiments, finally, what I wanted to do. So I started to work um, with a bacteria called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this bacteria is causing infections in many different settings. This bacteria is widely distributed in the nature, in water, in trees, in plants. It can be a plant pathogen as well. Um, no aeruginosa, a different species of Pseudomonas. Anyway. Um, but these bacteria also can cause pulmonary infections or it can be in surgical, surgical environments and attached to devices. And when you get surgery, you get infected. The person that was guiding me towards this project wanted to study how Pseudomonas aeruginosa could attach to prostheses, to joint prostheses, and how we can understand that development of biofilm. So we took very tiny pieces of what it will be different materials for joint processes, and we incubate them with the bacteria. We also measure different pigments because this bacteria is impressively uh, into foreign pigments that can be virulent, that can be toxic. Um, without getting into much details, this was um, the first time I had an intoxication through solvents because to extract this, these pigments, you need to use a lot of solvents and me being starting with my first experiments, I inhale what I shouldn't have. Um, it was funny, I will just say that. Um, but then it started to get more interesting. I started to see a side of photography, uh, which was microscopy. This was a scan electron microscopy, just to see the biofilms. At the top, I was working with a clinical isolate and at the bottom, we were working with an isolate that was extracted from uh, the Mount Roraima, which is a very uh, important place uh, in my country um, for preservation. And the thing about this section of my, my journey was to understand how using different microscopy, different type of photographies, you can observe and you understand how bacteria and microbes interact. This other example I bring here is fluorescent microscopy, and you basically level different elements of the biofilm, which are three-dimensional structures that grow under these little coupons, and, and you can see in red here the bacteria that are interacting with other proteins and, and elements of that biofilm. During this master, I, I was still trying to find my way. How am I going to really help people doing this Thing, taking photographs and I found another job. I found a job in an hospital doing diagnosis of tuberculosis, back to my roots, back to, to doing that, trying to revive that nostalgia of what I was doing in the jungle. 
This time I was not in the jungle, I was in the city, and I was working with extra pulmonary tuberculosis. So tuberculosis uh, is caused by a bacteria that you can breed it, um, and you can get infected your lungs. You can live in your lungs for years, and you never develop disease until you get vulnerable or through an, an any other condition that the bacteria wake up. Bacteria not only wake up and cause disease inside the lung, but it can cause disease in the outside of the lung. And that is what is called extra pulmonary tuberculosis. That was the work I was doing. Here, I didn't gain such a impressive techniques and new exciting techniques as microscopy. But this was another pivotal moment of my life. This was a very humble job. I wasn't doing much. Just in the microscope, reading slides and to see if I could find the bacteria, which is very strong, a fuchsia color. But in this Joe, who was my boss, he once received a mail saying, we're looking for a PhD applicant in France. Um, if anybody is interested, just let us know. He told me, well, maybe you can do this. I didn't know how to speak English. I didn't know how to speak French. And I say, yes, I will apply. I will do this. Um, and I did, and I till till today, I don't know how I did that interview. I did it in English. Um, I think I was using Google Translator in the site, likely that memories are faded um, right now, but I got the job and I went to France very few months after I finished uh, my thesis. And when I arrived to this lab, I was, about to find a completely new world of skills and techniques and also change of topic. In this case, I was working with a mycobacteria called mycobacterium abscessus, which also called pulmonary disease. But what they wanted to do here is go into molecular biology. I never done even a PCR before, um, which are the most basic technique and most classical technique of molecular biology. Here, what they want me to do is they want me to take pieces of DNA outside of the chromosome and try to see what they do, what they stop doing. I had no idea how to do that. And I couldn't speak French and I couldn't speak English. But it did happen at some point. And before jumping into that, I will give you a bit of context about this project. These mycobacterium abscessus cause pulmonary disease, and especially in people that are suffering from cystic fibrosis. Um, this bacteria is highly resistant to drugs, and it has a lot of proteins, such as the one that I show here in this schematic, um, that take the antibiotic, the drug, or whatever it is inside that is toxic, and put it outside and become resistant. And because these bacteria have a lot of these proteins, we wanted to understand which one are the responsible of resistance. And the process how it works is we have in the genome, we have genes. One of the gene encodes for a protein. In this case, the example is called TET-A, which is named after the tetracycline resistance mechanism. And we have another gene and encodes for a repressor, which controls that this doesn't do anything. But when we are in an environment of no antibiotic, this repressor, this sitting in front of that gene is blocking it, doesn't allow it to do anything. But when we have an environment of antibiotic, in this case, tetracycline, that antibiotic binds into that repressor, which looks like a weird butterfly, and doesn't allow this, this blockage, and the protein is produced. Once the protein is produced, it goes into the plasma membrane and extrude all the antibiotics. So we wanted to study if the same mechanism, if present, was related to other antibiotics that are used to treat mycobacterium abscessus infections. So we were looking, where are the proteins? Where are the genes? Are they called? How many they are? And there were over 30. Um, and it was a quite challenging task, trying to choose which one of these are we going to start with. Just to make the story short, because there were a lot of stuff that didn't work, I worked with a group of proteins, a group of genes that they had a very, very similar repressor in there. So what I did is I took that repressor gene outside of the gene, and we see that these both genes were overexpressed. Very similar mechanism than this. When this is not there, this one gets overexpressed. And actually, these 
two overexpression leads to high levels of resistance to the major antibiotic used to treat infections of mycobacterium abscess. But I'm going to jump to a different part of the project that I love the most, which was working with zebra fish animal model. This is a very fragile little thing. Um, it's transparent, which it makes it great to study infections in it. What you, what you have, we have a specialized fish that are fluorescent in their cells. In this case, these, fluorescent, these have uh, fluorescence in the macrophages and immunological cells. And we make the bacteria red fluorescence and we could infect the fish with the bacteria and we could see where is navigating this bacteria throughout the fish, where is establishing and how these bacteria lead to the death of this fish as well. This is one of my favorite parts of my PhD because I learned how to work with this specialized technique of microscopy, how to breed animal and, and how to understand bacteria act differently if you expose them to different antibiotics and how the disease evolves over the days. I will make a little pause here, a parenthesis, to speak about an uncomfortable topic, something that um, we never say, but it happens in every field. Difficult treatments, bullying, um, failures, are happening in science, are happening in several different fields. And I had to pass through that for a very long time. I just want to make this parenthesis here to say that we all deserve to be heard. We all deserve to speak. And please, if anybody is going through that, please speak out. Because science is such a wonderful place to, to work and to live with. And because of this experience I had, I was very strict in the following path that I will take next. I applied to over 30 jobs after I finished this project, which I loved, which led me to this place that I am here now in Norwich. So in Norwich, I started to work with foodborne pathogens in the Quadram Institute, which is two minutes away from here. And I was actually really happy. I found a very nice place, a lab where I had a very nice colleague, a great boss and a project that I loved. But then a little monster arrived that we all know. Um, and that forced me to not be in the lab at all. And I had to learn new techniques to be able to keep busy. And that was bioinformatics. Bioinformatics require um, that you learn how to code. It feels, for me, back then, it feels, I'm going to be in this black screen like a hacker, and I'm going to be able to rob a bank, maybe. If I learn how to do this thing, I'm going to wear a hoodie doing this. But actually, I end up putting a lot of colors, and now it, it's completely different. I was very um, nervous about working or getting into, again, a new challenge and getting into a different new field. Um, but it's actually have been very gratifying, because now we're moving every time more and more to sequencing, just as Anita mentioned. And I was happy to hear Sophie saying that if you're a biologist, you need to love DNA, evolution, and biodiversity. And that is where it led me, actually, my work here at Quadron. So I'm just going to put here this example of what I've been doing in my last project. And I'm working with Listeria monocytogenes. This is a foodborne pathogen that I can be found in different type of food, but also in nature. When you ingest uh, contaminated food, you develop listeriosis, which normally in healthy individuals, like most of us, it will cause just a diarrhea. But in those that are immunocompetent, it will lead to meningitis, and in pregnant women, it will also lead to abortion. I was working with a group of bacteria, a group of isolates that were sequenced, um, and working with all these sequences and all these uh, letters, trying to make sense of them, we built that evolution DNA data, which is represented here as a phylogenetic tree. It worked as a genealogic tree, very, very much like having the base of that tree, which will be your most ancient um, family. And then you will have branches that diversify with the younger, with the younger progeny. More or less that it work here. What I have done as well is to try to understand how different groups of these uh, branches of the tree uh, group and for new families. And we wanted to understand how each of these families have different traits that can help or lead to disease. And 
I'm not going to overwhelm you with this. I'm just going to let you know that when we're managing to understand which are the unique traits that are distinct to each of these families, distinct to each branches of families, and how some of them are linked to disease or to be more persistent in certain type of food or environments. I don't know where this job is going to lead me now. Um, what we have seen through this job is through these, uh, through these experiments I have done is most of the elements that are driving to this, to this evolution and to this presence are viruses, which are prophages that they get insected into the chromosome. I have no experience working with viruses before. Maybe in the next months or years, I will end up working with viruses or I will end up working with plants or I will end up working with the stem cells. Without sounding too cheesy, I hope for me and for you that if you get into science, you end up working in what you love and what it makes you happy. These are some of the people that have shaped and that have led me to where I am right now. And I'm very thankful to them, but I also want to thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. What a fascinating journey uh, you had. But it's as as you said, it's sometimes it's quite daunting when people think that we can't change our career because we don't have an expertise or we can't apply for a job because we don't have the technical expertise for that. But as you have shown that you uh, use PCR when you started your PhD and we would think that, oh, we should know PCR before we even apply for a PhD. But amazing. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it and, and would learn something from that. Thank you so much. So uh, we open for questions. Anybody? Yeah. So as you've shown through your own career, science is increasingly in international fields. Uh, what advice do you have both for people coming from overseas, especially maybe the global south, but also mentors working with people from different countries? I will say being open-minded is, is a thing that is, is an element that both guys need to have. Um, person receiving a person from overseas need to understand that there's a lot of elements, cultural speaking, challenges in barrier of, of language. Um, and you need to be open-minded to, to understand that that person might be trying to deal with the homesickness, uh, with not finding the food that likes, um, with missing family, husbands, children, or not even understanding what you're asking to be done. And to the other side, to the person that comes, is to be open-minded and trying to understand that not everything is going to be like home and not pretend that because you're here, people just need to please you. You need to also be, be flexible in the new journey that you're going to. Lovely. Any more questions? Right, thank you so much. Uh, that was really wonderful. Thank you to... Thank you to all our three speakers for the morning session. Uh, I hope everybody took something from their talk. Uh, now, uh, talking about the careers and the journey, we have got some uh, three flash talk speakers for the morning session. And these flash talk speakers will be talking about what they do and their career pathway in, in their five minute talk. And you will see the diversity of the work that is done in NBI besides people who are PhDs and postdocs are in research. What are the departments are very essential in this institute as well. So first, I would like to invite Tim Hicks, who is a science support specialist and a lab supervisor in John Innes Center. Over to you, Tim. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, to be honest with you, I struggled a bit with the brief for this talk. Um, it's aimed at a very, very wide audience um, and reflection on my over, own achievements isn't something that necessarily comes naturally to me. Um, but I was told, tell them a bit about how you got here or what you do. It'll be interesting. So on your head be it. <laughs> um, so how did I get here? Well, we all know the classic path into a science career, how it's meant to happen. Um, mine wasn't quite as straightforward as this. Um, 
perhaps a slight exaggeration, um, but it kind of feels accurate. <laughs> so what prompted this sudden change? It's clear something went terribly wrong at the start, but what prompted this sudden change about two thirds of the way through? Well, that was two conversations. Um, the first was with a six year old who asked me why I didn't have a proper job like other people. Um, I tried to joke it off and, you know, sort of say, oh, well, I don't know what to be. I don't, wanna, don't know what I want to be when I grow up. She wasn't phased at all. Um, and she said, well, what were you interested in when you were my age? I said, well, I don't know, probably dinosaurs and space and stuff. And she said, well, that's it then. You should be a space dinosaur scientist. Um, I tried to explain that you know, being a scientist, it's very difficult. It takes a long time lots of training. At this point, she stood up, declared that I'd become too boring to speak to, and walked away. The second conversation was when I found myself in Norwich passing the City College. I thought to myself, maybe I should pop in, sign up for a course or something, see if I can get myself another trade, uh, plumbing or plastering or something, I and mean, we always need plumbers, right? So I tentatively stuck my head in the door, and was immediately pounced on by a receptionist, and within a few minutes, I'd found myself sitting in an office opposite an advisor. And this advisor said to me, oh, this is, this is great. So you want to do a course. That's brilliant. Um, so what sort of things are you interested in? And please don't say plumbing or plastering or anything like that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> dinosaurs, science. <laughs> I knew how this conversation was going to go. And so I was, she had me completely... <laughs> at her mercy, and within a few minutes, I was signed up to two years of A-level equivalent science-based classes. So what kind of jobs give a good foundation for a science support role? Well, I can only say that these work for me and those. Um, <laughs> there is a semblance of a career in there somewhere. I did spend several years as a technical illustrator and then IT coordinator for a technical publications firm in Hitchin, um, although it was still a fairly squiggly path. <laughs> so, although much of this is irrelevant, um, I have performed enough jobs to know that I'm enjoying myself when I'm learning and helping others. If I had to name two transferable skills that I've brought with me, it would be customer services and the ability to grasp technical information. This certainly isn't a job for someone who can't follow instructions or likes to bluff their way through life. So what exactly do I do here? Well, I, along with several colleagues, am part of a team that provides the lab support service across the JIC site. Um, that's a wide ranging field. Thankfully, the scientists are pretty grateful for our services. We often hear Oh, they're very good. They do all the washing up and stuff. So, but what's exactly involved? Well, washing up itself can be a little bit more technical in the lab. Collection, sorting, decontamination, disposal, label and residue remove, removal, washing, drying, sterilizing, refilling, restocking, returning, washer maintenance, troubleshooting, fault repair. What about the other stuff? Well, that's much broader. One aspect is media preparation. A lot of you here will likely have had us make you five litres of something or a couple of litres of something else. In total, that's last year, was just under 16,000 litres of media that were produced for the labs. That's, if you're interested, that's enough to fill the arteries of 65 African elephants or three blue whales. Um, or you can grow plants with it or leave it on a shelf to grow mouldy. It's entirely up to you. Other things, well, there's far too much to list here, really. Um, this is a selection. But to, but to summarise, if you're not sure where something goes, why something is beeping, what to do with a puddle, 
how to get in and out of the building, anything that's related to the lab, we try to help. And if we can't help, we'll try to point you to someone that can in one of the other excellent support services across the site, purchasing facilities, health and safety, hort services, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the take home message? I'm still not entirely sure, but these things popped into my mind. Um, I always seek career advice from children from now on. <laughs> um, support roles are a valued and a, are valued and they're a good option for those who enjoy helping others, especially helping others achieve great things. And adult education services need your support. So thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> space dinosaur technology. Well, thank you, Tim. <laughs> I must say out of that 16,000 liters of media preparation that they have done, 1,000 or more would have been from our lab. And this is the best stage, uh, uh, this place to say thank you so much to you and your team to do that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julia Monday. Uh, Julia is a science technician in structural uh, biology platform in John Innes Center. Uh, here to you, Julia. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> um, hopefully, everybody can hear me. All right. So there are oh, that's on me. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And I apologise for any high school English class flashbacks that causes. Um, but Shakespeare penned this line at a time when the realm beyond what we could see with our eyes was mysterious and full of monsters and terrors. Um, plagues lurked in miasma that you breathed in. Um, and the workings of our own bodies was largely mysterious to us. We didn't even actually really realise what we were made up of. Science was more of a set of concepts than the intricate uh, methodical entity it is now. Uh, less than a century later, scientists were able to see into this unseen world for the first time um, using microscopes, which are small enough to hold in your hand, two inches or so. And they found small little animalcules, which unfortunately are, have the much less cute name of bacteria nowadays. Um, but they were found inside a water droplet, or they observed that plants, as you've seen earlier in the talks, are composed of smaller microscopic compartments known as cells. Um, it's what we were made up of as well. So not having a handy little camera in their pocket, uh, scientists were drawn to draw what they saw. So this is where the art of seeing the unseen comes in. So they produced beautiful books of engravings and illustrations of what they'd seen down the microscope, tiny little fibers in clothing, these animalcules, and um, anything else that they'd seen down their microscopes to share with the wider world. But the more you look, the more you find. And it eventually became clear that cells were themselves home to a smaller realm, and that is the world of proteins. So every cell in your body contains tens of thousands of different types of proteins, and they're, they're all a little bit different. They all have their own little role to play within the cell. And much like the orchestra described earlier, they all work together to ensure that your cell works in the way that it should. It survives, it provides for your body how it should do. Um, and that's very important for you, of course. Um, a protein's role is often closely related to its actual physical structure, to the, its physical shape, and we call that the structure. So when we refer to structural biology, that's what we mean. Um, much like how a key is specifically shaped to fit the lock of your front door, perhaps, um, a protein can be specifically shaped to interact with its target or other proteins, and that allows it to um, carry out its job. If that shape is kind of hindered somehow or impaired or damaged, so maybe the protein gets heated or there's a bacteria that kind of produces another protein that will uh, inhibit it, then they can no longer function. So we are, we as scientists are hugely interested in this structure and any changes that might happen to it um, to get to the root of kind of diseases and what happens either in plants or in people as well. To pause and give you an idea of scale here, because we've been, all been talking about these concepts, but maybe you wouldn't have necessarily related to this to actual size. 
So your average skin cell is around 30 micrometers in size, um, a micrometer being a millionth of a meter. So your basic benchtop microscope can help you to see that. But a protein is much, much smaller. We need to go smaller. A single protein is mere nanometers in size, and that's only a few billionths of a meter. So very, very tiny. Um, and these weren't seen for around 300 years after cells were first observed. Scientists were able to see proteins using a technique called protein crystallography. So this gathers billions of the same type of protein molecule together in an ordered format to form a crystal. So much like the, the crystals you might find in rings, proteins can form similar structures. But unfortunately for us, proteins don't like to do that. We're, we're not made of crystals. We're, 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 way, we're more, way more kind of wibbly than that. Um, so we need to force proteins to want to grow a crystal. And you know, you, you can try talking to them and be like, hey, can you just help us out and make a crystal? But you need a lot more technical skill than that uh, to get a crystal to grow. So this, uh, the John Inner Center, is where I come in, because most of the time, biologists have a protein, they have a question, but they don't have the, the knowledge of X-ray crystallography that, that I perhaps do. So if they were on their own, where would they start? So through the structural biology platform here at John Innes, um, I help them set up their experiments. I help them grow their crystals. And at the end of it, I help them harvest their crystals and get them safely to the microscope. So this isn't a microscope that you can fit in your hand or on the bench or even in this room. It's about half a kilometer across and it generates really intensely bright X-rays, which are billions of times brighter than the sun. The workings of all of this science, you'll just have to trust me, is a story for another day. But put a crystal in front of these x-rays and it allows you to see into the unseen world of proteins and see the shape of your protein um, in, in ultra detail and in 3D. So scientists can tell exactly what shape that protein is and they can even see where it may interact with its partner or target and then they can see any changes that might have happened due to a disease and that allows them to design better drugs to understand processes better and to understand maybe how to prevent crops from going down to these diseases or prevent people from going down to these diseases. Better the devil you know and all that. Um, before I go, there is a third and final unseed world that we've all been talking about today, and that's the world of technicians. And when I first started out on my career journey, I hadn't seen this world either. I thought, I'll go to university, I'll get a degree, I'll get my PhD, and then I'll become a scientist, and then eventually I'll have my own lab. I hadn't seen this world of technicians or how immensely beneficial and satisfying a role as a technician can be in helping people perhaps understand things they wouldn't have access to if you didn't use your skills and apply your skills to help them. And the Norwich Research Park has a wealth of these skills, and much like the proteins in the cell, the, the technicians all have their own kind of roles, they're all kind of specialist um, kind of techniques that they know, and they can all work together to help deliver the amazing science that the John Innes Centre has become so world-renowned for. Indeed, there are more things in heaven and earth. You may just need technicians to help you see them. Hey, Julia. So Julia is not just not the technician in science. She is also an illustrator and is focused on digital art artwork. And I guess this is one of your creations, Julia. Then, <laughs> thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mark Hughes. Um, he's a synthetic biology support officer in the TESL. Right. Over to you, Mark. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in front of you all today. Down, did you say? Okay, my role, I'm a support officer, synthetic biology. The main focus I want to talk to you today is basically how I got here. But before we get there, it's basically just to focus on what we do. So, synthetic biology support officer. We, as Sophia has commented previously, a lot of the fundamental biology that starts with a lot of the research that we do here and a lot of the fields are based around genes and are based around DNA. So a lot of the research starts with the expression of a gene. 
But in order to express your gene, you need to have it in the right backbone. You need to have the right promoter driving it. You need to have the right terminator at the end of it. You also have elements where you want to see it. So having the uh, protein being expressed or having a tag at the end, like the all of the GFPs and everything that you can see, so you can see the proteins. All of these are essential parts of DNA fragments, which have to be assembled together. So the researchers can do the work they want to do to get the results that they want. So here at TSL Synthetic Biology, we have a massive library of parts. So we have all of, I don't know if you actually can see on here, but there's numbers on the bottom show you how many parts of each construct we have. Um, so basically what we do is they come to us and say, we need this part, we would like this part, maybe we don't already have it. If we don't have it, we make it and add it to the library. We then distribute all of this to all of the research on site. We actually distribute it all around the world. So what we actually do is we make the bits, we send them into the library, and we distribute them to everybody what they, what, that they need. So basically, we are sort of a distribution center, if you want. We also have a central role in supporting cloning in that we don't mean the cloning and making animals and doing Dolly the sheep. Cloning generally is the assembly of DNA fragments together. Um, this has been done by many different methods and it's been streamlined due to the initiatives that were brought into the TSL by Sophie and some of the other group leaders at the time. So we basically set up the system and we got it running. It's been running now since 2013 and it's working extremely well. Um, so the main function of what we do it here, sorry, I need my glasses, um, is to make Golden Gate parts, distribute them, as I said, and provide cloning experience to all of the researchers on site. Uh, the method we use now is called Golden Gate cloning. The Golden Gate cloning is basically where you put all the parts into a single pot, add some enzymes, put it in a PCR machine, and it assembles it itself. It's a lot more efficient, it's a lot faster, it's a lot cheaper to say it's a one pot reaction. The main downside of this is what we use what's called restriction enzymes, which is basically what cut the DNA. Unfortunately, because we use pairs of these, these cannot be within the sequence we need. So we have to unfortunately do what's called domestication, which is when you remove the restriction sites from the native sequences. So this is basically what we have on site here. We have a website where the users can go on. Now, as I say, there's over 1,100 different parts in our library now, um, and we continually add them all of the time. So basically what you do is you go onto our website, and the, the website link is there. You basically click on the section that you want or the part that you want. You add it to your basket, and you basically just say, send. It comes through to us. We make it. We prepare it. You provide an aliquot. You get an app that you get a... Uh, an email sent out to say it's ready for collection and you come and get it. Simple as that. Uh, the system works extremely well and we get, well, maybe up to 10 orders a day. And each of those orders can be single ones or they can be 20. Many researchers, when they move on to other institutes now, they send us requests and we can prepare up to 200 different, quite often, parts that people want to come and get. So basically, what we have, the very good, very efficient system that is being picked up by most of the institutes here. So the most important thing about really is how I got to where I am. Now, I started back in 1992 under what was called a youth training scheme, which is very, very similar to the uh, T-levels students where you are today. So I started there. And when I say I started there, funding and the pay then, I used to receive £35 a week. So things have come along these days, I hope. But after the initial uh, YTS scheme, I then became uh, an official technician. And here I started uh, cloning straight away. Well, not, sorry, I didn't start cloning. I started working with DNA straight away. Some of the protocols we were using took a day and a half we can do that in 20 minutes these days. So things have come along very, very rapidly. 
and advanced quite a lot over the years. I did a stint uh, in the University of Cambridge, um, working as a general technician, but then after that, I joined the MRC LMB. Now, the MRC LMB is probably one of the top institutes in the world with alumni of 13 uh, Nobel Prize winners. So I was very pleased to be able to work there and you are literally a wealth of people behind you and so much experience. I gained a lot of experience there. So I started cloning in about 1996. And by the time I joined the MRC, I was cloning full time. So for 11 years, I'd cloned constantly. <laughs> and I made construct after construct after construct. Um, I joined TSL in 2013, where we set up the Golden Gate Library. And I became platform leader of synthetic biology in 2016. TSL is equivalent to the MRC and LMB with the absolute, uh, how to explain them, the people behind you are so committed, they are so experienced, they are, yeah, it is just amazing. So it's a wonderful place to work. Um, I would just like to say, if you're going to go into this field, my career path is very, very different in that, unlike most people that go through the standard uh, GCSE A-level uh, degree, I did my degree and I did all of my school while I worked full time. It took me seven years to get my degree in total. So not only are you doing a full time job, you're also um, learning and doing all of your uh, assessments via day release. But in saying that, it gave you a fundamental basis behind the research so that you could actually fully understand what was going on. And the T-level really gave you a platform where you actually learned on the job as opposed to doing your schooling first and then finding out when you actually get to, the, 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 to do the job that it's not exactly what it's set out to be. So it is really a, an excellent way to get into a job and I would highly recommend it. Um, just before I go on, I've got one more slide here. I just want to mention, please, that while I've got a, uh, an audience that I would just like to say here, that please can people support these people? I know this is a personal thing for me, but having suffered a sudden brain hemorrhage on South World Beach back in 2001, I wouldn't be here without these people. So please, can I just take this opportunity to say, if you could please support these people, because I know from personal experience, never know when you or your loved ones really might need them. So please take this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. What an amazing career you had and the immense knowledge that Mark has got and their team and we all are always benefited for that and we rely on these people. Uh, well, uh, this is the end of our first se uh, morning session. I would like to say thank you to all our three main speakers uh, for the interesting talk. And I hope every uh, all of you, uh, you enjoyed the talk and you all of you took something from each talk. And thanks a lot to all the technicians. Uh, you do an incredible job and we are really, really thankful for that. So this uh, ends our morning session. We Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll let you get seated and settled. Uh, my name is Andrew Stronach. I'm Head of External Relations and Engagement over at the Quadrum Institute. Um, for what it's worth, I am not a scientist. Um, I studied English literature and language. So Julia, thank you for the Shakespeare this morning. That was brilliant. Um, what I am is a storyteller. So science communications is my job, and my team's job. We were treated to some fantastic talks this morning, and I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic series of talks this afternoon as well. So I'd like to welcome you all and say thank you to the support from John in the Centre for the costs of the event um, and the technician's commitment. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lunch if you got some. Um, Accessible Science Talks first started in um, 2016. And I think, um, sorry, just move back. From my point of view, I think it's really valuable that technicians get the recognition they deserve for the contribution that they make. So um, Quadrum's not been involved in this event before. This is our first time. 
Um, it's fantastic to be involved, and let's hope that we continue to be involved in the future. So without much further ado, I think I'll hand over to James for his flash talk. Uh, good afternoon, I hope you all had a nice lunch. Uh, I'm Jim Lipscomb, a uh, senior research assistant in the Genomics Pipelines Group at the Earlham Institute. Um, and I specialize in liquid handling automation. Um, so for those who are not aware, the Earlham Institute, we uh, sort of at the forefront of computational data-driven biology. Um, we back up with high-performance sequencing platforms and other complementary technology, um, including liquid handling robots, um, which is what I do. Um, so we work on living systems from across the tree of life. And personally, I've worked on all kinds of things from bacteria and viruses and naked mole rats and pigeons and even some truly detestable things like strawberries. And um, uh, so I use um, robots to move tiny amounts of liquid between vessels and to mix them and, and to heat them up and shake them and cool them and these sort of things and to do uh, molecular biology assays. Um, to make them more um, more high throughput, safer, cheaper, faster. There's lots of reasons why we automate things. Um, and <clears throat> and I've been doing this for uh, a number of years. Um, so how did I get here? Um, well, my career inside started at the ripe old age of 32 um, when I came to the depressing realisation that up to that point in my life, uh, apart from a brief period at about the age of 15 when I knew everything, um, I didn't really know a great deal. I had very few skills and I didn't feel like I was contributing anything to the world in which I'd be raising my children. Um, so I'd left school at 16. Um, I hated school. I couldn't wait to get out. And I didn't go to college or university, anything like that. I took a job at the dry cleaners initially. That's my first ever job. Um, and then for the next dozen or so years, uh, I was serving pints in a pub, cooking steaks, making margaritas. That kind of thing. And I did that, yeah, so it was at least 12 years, I think. Um, and that was my life, uh, and I hated it. Uh, I did train as a um, computer network technician. Um, and that didn't work out for me. Turns out the people who do that job for a living are angels with infinite patience, and I'm not one of those. Um, so when I relocated back to Norfolk, I went looking for new opportunities where I could draw on the experiences I did have but in something other than food and drink related business. Um, I applied for 103 jobs in one month when I came back down here when I was unemployed. Uh, and I had one response, um, which a, a door opened for me um, from Johnny in his center. And they let me try out for a job as a DNA sequencing operative. It was a, a temporary maternity cover post. Um, I knew nothing about DNA sequencing, but I was already interested in science, particularly in the mechanisms of evolution. So it wasn't a completely alien concept to me. Um, and it was actually mostly a customer service job. So I was very familiar with 80% of the work in a way, dealing with inquiries, occasional complaint, that sort of thing. Um, but they had this sort of technical side, which I picked up and I really, really enjoyed. Um, I very quickly also learned that science and technology move um, a hell of a lot quicker than the hospitality industry does. Uh, in order to keep up, I had to, for the first time in my life, uh, make a habit of learning new things. Um, and I still do that to this day, whenever I get the chance. I, I love to work on new things. It's my passion. Um, so when I was uh, working in a pub all those years ago, the largest genome that had ever been sequenced was the yeast genome. And the human genome and all the technical and biological medical advances uh, and insights that have followed from that achievement. That was still seven or eight years away, I think, something like that. Um, so I had no idea about what was going on in the lab. I didn't even know that a liquid handling robot was a thing. Um, uh, but I'm very, I'm very happy to have worked on all kinds of projects, um, including uh, all sorts of things. So like a project with the John Innes Center and an international consortium to produce what was at the time the most complete wheat genome available works on an international effort to track the spread of antibiotic resistant salmonella uh, in the developing world. Um, more recently, I was involved in um, with an amazing group of uh, technicians, scientists, and many others here at the Norwich Research Park to set up COVID testing facilities in a, in a hurry at the beginning of the pandemic. 
and that's one of the, the high points of my career. That was a, a wonderful occasion, uh, despite everything else that was bad about it. For me, it was great to see this community of scientists all coming together and working for a common goal. It was great. And seeing plant scientists apply their skills to that was brilliant. Um, more recently, also, I, I worked on a project using uh, single cell uh, transcriptomics and genomics, as uh, um, I need to describe this morning, using very similar techniques um, to uh, capture the, the genomes and transcriptomes of individual protists from wild water sources, um, such as rivers and ponds and lakes, etc. So that's part of the Darwin Tree of Life project, um, which has the aim of sequencing all the genomes of eukaryotic organisms in Britain and Ireland. So that was in collaboration with the uh, University of Oxford. So I've worked on all kinds of things, and I love what I do. And uh, I'm always amazed when I think back that pouring a beer, it never occurred to me that the simple act of moving liquid from one vessel to another, which is basically what I do in my job, I program robots to do that. Uh, that, that simple act could be so important, not just in keeping me gainfully employed, but also in the advancement of human knowledge. And I feel very grateful every day for the opportunity to do that here at Norwich Research Park. And uh, the message I want to take home to you, what you take home really is that you don't have to have a standard career, university, etc., PhD, to be working in science and contributing to the advancement of human knowledge. Um, that we're all working towards and um, there's lots of other ways to do it and there's no right or wrong way it's just you know that i always think you know that the treasure you end up with is not necessarily what you're digging for again okay? i've ended up uh, very happy in a career um, that i never expected uh, never imagined and uh, i hope that happens to everybody in some way okay, thank you very much Thank you, James. I'm going to introduce uh, Lizzie Meadows now from the Quarterman Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jim, for that really interesting talk. Um, I'm Lizzie Meadows. Good afternoon. I am the clinical liaison manager for the Quadrum Institute. Um, I went to the Quadrum February 2020. Um, initially for three months, and I'm there nearly four years later. And I think the COVID pandemic had something to do with that. Um, so I'm here to, today to tell you about my journey. Um, I'm certainly not STEM. I didn't study STEM A-levels. I did English, History of Art, French, RE. And um, initially I trained as a nurse. And then I specialised in cardiology and cardiothoracic medicine. And I worked at the Brompton Hospital in London. And just around the corner was Chelsea School of Art. So in the evenings, I'd go and do history of art courses. And um, I was there for about a year and a half. And then I moved up to Oxford and went to the John Radcliffe Hospital to work on a very busy cardiothoracic surgical unit. Um, but those of you who know Oxford will know about the Ashmolean Museum and the Museum of Modern Art. And it wasn't long before I found myself working at the Museum of Modern Art on my days off. Um, and it got to the point where I thought, you know, I've got to do something. Um, I really want to take my art history a little bit further. And um, so I came to UEA and I spent three years in the Sainsbury Centre. And um, I became the first student guide, which was great. And then um, when I graduated, um, I went to Christie's. I was very lucky to get a job in the ethnographic department at Christie's Auction House in London and um, absolutely loved every minute of it. And then from there, I went back to work at the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford um, in the education department. Um, and I kept, kept up to date with my nursing. I kept up to date with my um, continuous professional development. So I would bank nurse at weekends when I was working at Christie's and I'd work on intensive care units, critical care units, theater recoveries, etc. And it sort of stood me in good stead. Um, and at one point I was invited to take part in an expedition to Everest. There was a joint forces cleanup expedition in 2000. And um, I was invited to go along as the nurse, so I did. And then that kind of led on to the next stage of my career, which was in writing and doing some PR. So um, I 
worked for, I wrote as a freelance journalist for about three or four different magazines in London. I had my daughter in 2002 and a combination of being able to work as a freelance writer and doing bank nurse and intensive care units um, meant that I could carry on working and, and around her. Um, and then we moved up to Norfolk in 2005 and I had to say goodbye to nursing at that point. So then I um, focused on the PR and I worked for Vaywood Literary Festival and um, worked very closely with David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. And, um, and also I did some voluntary work for Lowestoft Air Festival and um, interviewed Dame Vera Lynn for, uh, I think it was the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Britain, um, which was fabulous. I went and spent a couple of hours with her down in her home in Sussex and she was such a lovely lady. Um, and then in 2011, um, I got a call asking if I'd be interested in doing some comms for the um, communications for the NHS. There was a big merger taking place between Norfolk and Suffolk Mental Health Services to create Norfolk and Suffolk Foundation Trust. And um, so I went on board as their um, strategic change communications lead. And it was someone to really deal with the internal communications, so that keeping the doctors and nurses um, and the other major stakeholders aware of what was going on. And I did that for about eight or nine months. And I was sitting in a board meeting one day and um, someone was looking for um, a clinical implementation lead to drive forwards a completely wacky project called electronic prescribing. Um, and this is going back to 2012. And, um, and I put my hand up and said, you know, I could do that because I'm a nurse and I understand prescribing processes and I can talk to people and I can talk to your, you know, that your cohort that you want to engage with. So I got the job doing that and I did it for, I was clinical implementation lead for six months before the project manager left. And um, so I took that on as well. And I did uh, the PRINCE2 project management course. Um, and then from then on went and did something called agile project management and change project management as well. So I've got all three qualifications. And I was there to head hunt, headhunted to go over to Liverpool to work on electronic prescribing, setting up chemotherapy regimens. So again, very, very different from where I kind of started, but bringing together my, um, you know, nursing, my clinical skills, my communication skills, the art had to go to one side. Um, and I've, as a project manager, I've also worked for um, Well Pharmacy uh, with work, in a big co collaboration with WH Smith to open the first of its kind pharmacy within a WH Smith store at an airport. So I led on that and we, we um, went live at Gatwick on the 1st of April, 2019. And um, that model was successful. So it was rolled out to Heathrow and I think to Manchester as well. And then um, fast forwards to February, 2020. And I came to deliver um, a lab information management system for the NRP biorepository. So the biorepository had got um, 2.4 million pounds of BBSRC funding to make it gold standard um, and, you know, a world leading centre um, for, for collecting um, human tissue samples for research um, into disease and health and other interventions. And I've been there about a month. And we went live on the 23rd of March 2020 which was the day that we went into lockdown. And it was also the day that the Quadrum had been announced as being the regional lead for genome sequencing for COVID. And um, an email went around, they were looking for a project manager or someone's program manager. And I put my hand up and I thought, well, we've just gone live with this lab information management system. You know, maybe we can use that. And um, anyway, that was the start of a big journey. So I worked with the genome sequencing team. We brought the biorepository on board. Bar repository is an NNUH NHS department. Um, the Quadrum Institute isn't, and there are ethics challenges for that, for sequencing and matching data. So having the bar repository there that could manage the metadata and then um, enable the Quadrum to match up their positive samples with the metadata uh, meant that we had a very quick win. And out of 130 countries that were sequencing around the world at this time, the Quadrum was ranked as number four. So after America, Australia, and England as a whole. 
and as Jim said, his work with, um, you know, it, during the, the pandemic was probably something he's most proud of. It was certainly um, something I've been most proud of as well. I think that was my career highlight. Um, so I continue to work with the Bar Repository. Um, we're developing um, online consent, so participants who want to um, donate their samples for research can go online and consent online. Um, I've also been working with King's College London and the NNUH on an AI big data extraction tool called Cogstack. Never in a million years did I think I'd get involved with AI, but I have. Um, and we've got it to a point now where the NNUH has taken it on and is um, working it up to use it for data preparedness exercises for when they implement their electronic patient record. So that has value. Um, and the other thing I'm working on at the moment is a faecal microbiota therapy unit, which is in build over at the Quadrum. And there'll be more about that at another time. So a little bit more just to finish off. I do work full time. My daughter is now 21. She's at university up in Scotland. Um, I've got three dogs. I've got three Jack Russell Terriers, Hector, Kiki and Dido. I've also got two rescue rabbits. We did have a horse, but he sadly had to fly the nest as well, because um, I can't do everything. And um, so my hobbies, still horses, skiing, singing, travel and art when I get time. And what I'd say to you is you, I've had very much of a collect, uh, an eclectic career. Um, I've been very much driven by opportunities. Um, and I'd say to you, you know, don't hold yourself back. Believe in yourself. And... Be open to opportunities because you don't know where they'll lead. Hello, my name's Lewis Hollingsworth, and I work in horticultural services. Uh, that's me. <laughs> um, yeah, I've worked in horticultural services for, since 2013, so a few years now. Um, I came straight from college, uh, Eastern, in fact, uh, doing my BTEC Level 3 Diploma in Horticulture. Um, so it's always, well, before that, I'd always been in, uh, interested in plants and stuff, so... I've got quite a big indoor plant collection at home, as well as like a veg block that I attempted this year. Um, still a work in progress. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've been there 10 years. So in that time, I've seen quite a bit of change, actually. Um, when I first started, I, um, I was under the supervision of one of my um, previous colleagues looking after one glass house. And um, back then, um, a lot of manual labor, as in like, watering, um, simple tasks around like soil mixing as well. <clears throat> it was all done manually. But um, since, well, in that 10 years, I've seen quite a bit of change. So, uh, slide, yeah. Um, so yeah, in the 10 years, we've had quite a lot of automation. So um, whereas before it was like watering plants by hand, which should take quite a long time, especially in the summer months and the mum, uh, some months we've had recently have been quite intense. Um, you quite often go around like twice, three times a day. Um, but now we have a system in place which uh, it's called Ebb and Flood, and it's all um, done with the press of a button now. So basically all the benches fill up from underneath, and it just means that I can spend my time doing other things, um, and there's plenty of other things to do. Um, yeah, basically, so uh, since I joined, uh, I was given that one glass house. I then uh, progressed to looking after CERs, which are controlled environment rooms. And um, I was basically growing Arabidopsis and uh, Nicotiana benthamania in, um, in there. Um, I was only in there briefly until I um, amassed a few uh, glass houses under my supervision when um, one of my colleagues had uh, moved away to work in New Zealand. Um, on the screen, actually, there's a pointer. Yeah, so um, as you can see, there's quite a lot of glasshouse space on here. And I think I'm not used to seeing things from bird's eye, so 
Uh, I look after this range of glass houses. Uh, these are the South 50s. Uh, it's a bit of an odd photo, actually, so it's changed a bit. Um, there's about, there's eight I look after there, but also we have a few polytunnels on site. Um, they're here, and uh, they're all grown for cereals, but also brassicas and ash trees. They're currently working on the um, ash dieback, um, which is quite a big project, so that we've got polytunnels for them. Um, there's also a collection of polytunnels, I can't think you can see on here, just up in the corner there. <clears throat> which are currently being installed with uh, heating and lighting, which is um, going to be really beneficial because um, my department's going through quite a bit of change, actually. So within the next, maybe even decade, actually, we're, we're having a complete, um, uh, yeah, basically all this is coming down, apart from this, uh, well, the glass houses, not the buildings here, but it's all going to be under one roof. So um, all my area... The glass houses will be knocked down and there'll be polytunnels built there <clears throat> but also this area here will be um knocked down as well and um horticultural services will all be on, under one roof so um the work's just started uh we've got uh, a star wars themed looking <laughs> controlled environment room uh in this building here it's pretty pretty cool and it's all done by a touch of button so um, that means we can program things individually. We have so many like, remote accessible uh, rooms, so we can literally work from home, seeing like, the temperatures and what is happening at, in real time, which is really beneficial. <clears throat> um, but basically, <sighs> there's going to be a lot of change happening in the next few years. So uh, the work never stops. So we will be going through a a transition phase uh, where we're working around the builders on site. <clears throat> but it's um, it's going to be really beneficial because uh, some of the glass houses are like 40 years old now. So um, they're looking a bit decrepit in some parts, but with the plans that you can see online, it's going to look pretty high tech um, in the next few years. Like I say, they've just done the CERs, controlled environment rooms in this one here. We're also having a lot of changes in there with regards to having more CRs on the ground floor. <clears throat> this is where we have our saw mixing plant, which I'm involved in. So if I skip to the next slide. Uh, yeah. So on here, that was another shot of me a couple of times. <laughs> um, yeah, on the ground floor, we have this, we have now uh, saw mixing capabilities with our high-tech saw mixing machine and pot and tray fillers. So we do all our saw mixing on site now. Whereas before we'd import um, ton bags of compost, we can now we now have the capabilities of mixing our own for various uh, crops. So there's a lot of um, cereals on site. So our main uh, soil mix is cereal mix. So uh, as you can see here, it's all done on like a, um, a a belt system where it goes around, and we can just uh, include like um, ingredients into our mixes, such as osmocote, slow release fertilizer. Um, and pH um, uh, dolomite, which adjusts the pH and uh, makes it so that the plants grow happily, which is what we want. <laughs> um, but this is just an example of one of the glass houses. Um, it would be the one that I don't look after. <laughs> um, but this is the ebb and flood system that we have in place now, whereas before it used to be all manually watered. Uh, this system is now being uh, put in throughout uh, horticultural services. Um, so like I say, it's um, done with the touch of a button. You can set up a bench in minutes and it'll be good to run. You just got to check it now and again. And plant maintenance as well. We, we do, we have a ticket system whereas, whereas uh, uh, any user in our glass houses can request their plants to be maintained. So um, potting, staking and tying, which we do in-house. Um, you can literally, from your office, put in a ticket for us to uh, do the work for you and you should come and see your plants looking as you would hope. Um, pest and disease is also something that we try and keep on top of a lot more now. Um, so once a week I tend to <coughs> do my um, pesticides and fungicide sprays in the glass houses. Um, 
this just kind of just helps keep things a lot cleaner because hygiene plays a big part in the, keeping the plants happy and healthy. Um, especially now as it's approaching the winter months, we will have, uh, you will see a bit of a disco thing going on if you drive past the glass houses. <laughs> we have um, full spectrum LED lights installed in um, the majority of them now, um, which is also done uh, by the touch of a button. So we can program any one of these lights to come on under a, over a bench um, as we fill the glass house up. And it just means it's obviously more efficient because you're not having to turn on the whole glass house just for a few plants. But it's also much easier because each one of these is uh, programmable. So you can have these uh, under a different spectrum to another next to it, if you so wish. So um, the changes have been vast in my department <clears throat> since I started. Uh, we also have these fancy looking electric trike things that are pretty cool. Pretty cool to drive around. You um, get a few funny faces looking at you now and again. But <laughs> basically, we're, they're useful for, um, we make deliveries of pots and plants. It just means uh, things around here are a lot more, lot less labour intensive, whereas before we'd have um, pretty much trolleys upon trolleys of plants that you'd have to uh, to and fro between the glass houses and <clears throat> polytunnels. These you can just hook up to a trolley, take them straight to the glass house or polytunnel and then Bob's your uncle, it's easy. Um, so they're really fun to use. Um, on top of that, we have our ordering system as well, the crop requirement forms that some of you might have used before. Um, they've been really, well, they've been uh, updated in recent years so that um, with the touch of a button from the internet page you can put in your own form and request pots, standing orders of sowings, plant maintenance, all of that as well and that will then get sent to us where we then um, either if it's a pot or tray order we can make that on our machine which is capable of making hundreds and hundreds of pots as well as our pot filling machine, which is also capable of um, you know, enable, enables us to pot up hundreds and thousands, even uh, plants in, during the course of a year. <clears throat> so that's that's all part of my day-to-day -day job um, with all services. I, um, I can either be uh, calibrating the machines to run different pot sizes through, depending on the orders that we get. Um, we also have... Um, a uh, vast amount of uh, help desk requests now, which is a new thing, but went live, I think, last year. <clears throat> that just um, It just gives us the ability to kind of see uh, work come in as and when people request it. So it's um, it's quite a new, th a new system, but it uh, just gives peace of mind to people <clears throat> um, just to say that it's... That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, it gives us the ability just to kind of prioritize different jobs so plant maintenance becomes um, manageable then. Um, so I've waffled on a bit. Um, that's that's basically what I do, really. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Lewis. Now, without much further ado, I will introduce Joshua Waits. Um, Josh is a PhD student at John Innes Centre. Um, I think you did your undergraduate degree at Bristol. And a master's here as well. Over to you. Oh, this is great. Oh. Huh? We're not now time for many questions. Oh, yes, I yeah. All right. Hello. Okay, you can all hear me. Um, so, yeah, so I'm Josh, and as I said, a PhD student here. So today I'm going to give you a talk, uh, which I've titled Methods to Eat, Gene Editing for a Healthy Treat, which hopefully by the end of this you'll understand. Um, yeah, I don't think I had anything else to say for that. So let's just move on to what yeah, I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go through an yeah, overview quickly. So I'm going to first give a refresher on uh, DNA genes and genome, uh, just to go through it all again. Then talk about gene error, genetic modification and what that is and how we do it in plants. And then also talk about gene editing. So these two sound very, very similar, but they are uh, quite different. So I'm going to hopefully explain the difference between the two of them, because it does frustrate me to no end that they were called such similar things, because it makes it very confusing to talk about whether you're like GM or GE. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk about that. Then I'll introduce uh, what uh, part of my project. 
Um, and yeah, talk through that. So yes, let's go ahead and talk about DNA genes and the genome. Um, so yeah, so this is the DNA molecule, which we're all familiar with. Uh, and you'll probably have seen this double helix structure. Um, and this contains all the instructions for living things to grow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's seen as this three-dimensional structure, but we uh, like to write it as letters. So we'll write it as uh, A, T, G, or C. And within this code, um, which is made up as this molecule, uh, yeah, we have all the instructions on how cells can grow and how organisms can grow and develop. So um, yeah, these instructions come as genes. So these are, yeah, information, they're small sections of DNA that carry the information for your traits. So I've highlighted part of it. There's some DNA here, and um, we like to draw them as circles, uh, not circles, that is not a circle. We like to draw them as arrows along a genome. Um, so I'll use this throughout the talk, and I'll, yeah, if you ever see an arrow like this, it's because of a gene. Uh, and genes code proteins, which are then responsible for things like your traits. So for example, eye color. So um, I think eye color is quite a nice one because the difference between blue and brown eyes is due to just a single gene. Uh, but there's some other traits like height, which is due to many, many genes. Um, but yeah, so genes also come in different uh, variants or alleles, as we call them. So um, there'll be one variant of this eye color gene called HERC2, which codes for uh, brown eyes. And there'll be another variant which codes for blue eyes. Um, and the difference between this, uh, if you actually look at the DNA letters, is only a single um, DNA base or single DNA letter, uh, which is quite cool. That, um, I don't know between these, these quite striking differences in your eye color, it's just the single DNA letter difference, which I didn't really know before. Um, but yeah, so this is the same gene, just two different variants of the same gene or two different alleles. Um, and then finally, the genome is uh, an, organism, an organism's complete set of DNA. So this will be all of the genes inside an organism. For, uh, so for example, for humans, uh, we have 30,000 genes, which I think is not that many considering how complex we are and all the cool things our body does. Um, so it does surprise me that, yeah, it's only 30,000 different proteins makes up a human being, which I always think is a really cool fact. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about a kind of analogy throughout this talk, just to better describe things like genetic modification, gene editing. So I'm going to first introduce the analogy. So we have a genome which is made up of genes, and these genes code for our traits. So we can think of the genome as a kind of recipe book, and I think this is kind of described as such quite a lot. Um, and we can think of genes as recipes, and these code for a dish, such as bread. In this case, it's a bread recipe. Um, I do have a habit of talking very fast as well, so I'm sorry if I'm fast. I'll keep going. Huh? Okay, I'm perfect. Wow. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep at this pace. Uh, so yeah, so let's talk about genetic modification, or GM. So um, if we think back to our recipe example, we can see that a bread recipe will have the same kind of ingredients. We'll have flour, yeast, salt, and water. So um, this is the same kind of set of cooking ingredients. And if you gave this recipe to basically any human that had the same ingredients, they would probably make bread. So all chefs could read this recipe and make the same kind of recipe. And it's, it's similar for genes. All genes um, will code for the same set of ingredients. And these are the amino acids that build up the proteins. So these uh, assemble together based on what the DNA says, and you have a protein. Um, and all organisms have the same set of ingredients and will read genes in exactly the same way. So this means that any of these organisms here, if you give it the same gene, it will make the same protein, which is a really, really crazy fact. And this is just because, um, because of evolution, basically, which I think we can say about everything. Um, but yeah, what was I going to say here? I can't remember. My mind's gone blank. I'm sorry. Let me think. Genes, proteins. Yeah, so you give it all the same gene, and that's because we have one shared common ancestor if we go back far enough. So um, yeah, this means that DNA code is universal. Uh, so, so for us, for scientists and for plant breeders, I suppose, what this means is we could take a, a gene from, uh, say, the tomato's genome that's involved in disease resistance, and this gene will make a protein that uh, gives the, the tomato resistance against certain bacteria or disease, and we can put it into potato's genome, uh, like so. And now the potato will be able to produce this protein, so this disease resistance protein, and um, now it's resistance to this disease. So this is basically what GM is. You're taking a gene from one organism and you're putting it into the genome of another. So if we go back to our recipe book example, it's like having a recipe book that contains bread and one that doesn't contain bread. And we take the recipe for bread out of one of the books and we put it into the other book. Yeah, look at those animations, whoa. Um, and now that recipe book will now make bread. So that's kind of a very simple way to think about GM. Um, so yeah, so we're taking a gene out of one genome, putting it into another. And I guess the question is, how do we do this? So I'm going to cover this because I think this is quite cool of how we do it in plants. Um, and I guess when I learned about it, I was like really, yeah, quite interested about that. 
So we use a bacteria called Agrobacterium, which is called, uh, or is kind of known as nature's genetic modifier, because it does all of this uh, naturally in nature. So what it does, it goes along to a tree and it has a set of genes which tell the tree to make me a home and also make me loads and loads of food. And it incorporates those genes into the tree's genome. Um, and the tree says, yep, that's a great idea. I'm going to do just that for you. And it'll make these things called cankers, which look horrific. Um, and you probably would have seen them on trees and on plants in nature. And what this basically is, is a structure that keeps the bacteria safe inside them. And the uh, bacteria lives there very happily. And the plant produces loads and loads of sugars for the bacteria. So what we do as scientists is we come along and we say, no, don't give it that recipe. Um, instead, let's put a recipe that we're actually interested in. So, for example, can you make more vitamin A in your grains? And we give it back to the bacteria. The bacteria comes along um, and we tell it to infect this rice plant here. And the rice plant says, yes, that's a great idea. And now we have a golden rice, which is this example of GM where, um, yeah, you had a higher overaccumulation of vitamin A in the grains, which made them go yellow. So the way this worked was we took a recipe from, or sorry, we took a gene from maize um, and we put it into the rice's genome. And that then meant the rice plant produced more vitamin A in its genome. So yes, now we're going to move on to gene editing. Uh, so again, they sound very similar, um, but I'm hopefully going to, yeah, show the difference. And we're going to go back to the recipe book analogy. So with GM, we're taking a recipe from one recipe book, we're putting it into another recipe book. But with gene editing, we're actually editing the recipe within the same book. So we just go along, make our changes to the original recipe, and we don't shuffle it between any book. We're just changing that same recipe. So for genes, how this works is, say we had potatoes genome here, we have this gene, um, we could come along, make some uh, changes to it, um, and now the potato is resistant to this disease. So that's kind of, yeah, what GA gene editing is, and I hope that kind of makes a bit of sense. Uh, and also, so how do we do this? Um, so I'm sure everybody's kind of heard of this molecule called CRISPR, which is how we do genetic, uh, yeah, gene editing. Um, so the way this works is it has a target sequence, um, which we give it, and we basically say, can you scan along the genome and look for this sequence? And when it finds it, it'll make an edit using uh, these cut sites. So it can kind of be thought of as the um, the search feature on Microsoft Word, um, where you give it a sequence of DNA and you say, can you find the sequence along the genome? And it'll come along and scan along and it'll find that sequence. And when it's found that sequence, it will make a cut in the DNA like that. Bam. Um, and it's now just cut both strands of the DNA. So when this happens, the cell freaks out a bit and it just needs to get these two uh, strips of DNA together as quickly as it can because uh, it's quite deadly for the cell to have a cut in the DNA. And when it does, it introduces some random insertion or deletion of bases, and this creates a mutation. So this happens naturally. Um, when you're kind of, uh, I guess, have UV radiation or something, um, what creates a mutation is the UV radiation will, yeah, create a break in your DNA, and it will repair together and make a mutation at that site. So it's a natural process, and it's how it happens. But um, with CRISPR, we can specify where we want that mutation. So we call it a targeted mutagenesis technique. Um, but you might have the question of how does creating mutation actually help? Because mutation sounds quite scary. We associate it with kind of Frankenstein or mutants and things. But we've been selecting mutations for uh, thousands of years. So um, these vegetables at the bottom, so cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, uh, broccoli, and cauliflower, all, all, they're all actually the same plant um, called Brassica oleracea. And for thousands of years, we've just selected for natural mutations to have them change to how we want. So these vegetables aren't really natural. We've just been able to selectively breed them into these different shapes. But in fact, they're all the same plant, which is a pretty cool fact. Um, so yeah, so this is with natural mutations, but now we can targetedly say where we want our mutations to be. Uh, we can also do something uh, like turning a gene off. So for example, there's some genes in the genome which diseases use to infect a plant. And these are known as susceptibility genes. So uh, these are quite bad to have in the genome, of course, because it makes the plant, um, yeah, be able to be infected. So we can come along with CRISPR, uh, turn them turn them off by creating mutation in them, and now you can have a plant that's, uh, yeah, resistant to a disease. There's also like allergenic genes in different foods and different plants. So uh, the obvious one in wheat would be gluten, and uh, gluten is actually many many different proteins, but only some of these proteins produce this allergic response of celiac disease. So what we could do is we come along, turn these gluten proteins off, and then have celiac-friendly uh, bread wheat. And there's scientists doing that uh, around the world at the moment to hopefully make nice, um, 
nice wheat that is gluten safe. So gluten is still really important to make uh, bread. So it's really important for bread making properties. So it would be good to have the gluten proteins that you can make bread with, but aren't going to trigger an allergic response. Um, so yeah, so I hope I've described like gene editing and gene modification. So again, one, you're taking a recipe from one book and putting it to another and gene editing, you're editing the recipe from the same book. Uh, so now finally, I'm going to go on to talk about my project. So let's start off with um, melons. So melons come in this green flesh and orange flesh variety. So you, I guess, yeah, you have the green ones, which are like honeydew melons or the orange cantaloupe melons. And the difference between this is that the orange melons have a massive upregulation and a massive production of a compound called carotenoids. And this is a organic pigment. So it's responsible for the nice yellow and amber colors that we see in vegetables and we see in nature. Um, it was first discovered in carrots, hence carotenoids. Um, and it's also responsible for nice yellow and amber colors of flowers and flower petals. Uh, so yeah, so they're quite nice organic pigments, but um, they're also quite important for human health because certain carotenoids are um, converted in your body to vitamin A, and that's really important for um, the, the development of your eye. So this is why you have the saying of um, eat carrots and leafy vegetables because it will give you night vision. It won't actually give you night vision, but it will be uh, useful for your eyesight. So that's where that saying comes from. And if you don't have enough vitamin A in your diet, you have something called vitamin A deficiency. Um, and it's especially prevalent in uh, uh, children as they develop. And it's uh, vitamin A deficiency is the leading cause of parental blindness, um, a preventable childhood blindness. And 250,000 to 500,000 children a year go blind from vitamin A deficiency. Uh, and it's especially prevalent in areas that rely on staple crops, uh, which are quite low typically in vitamin A. So uh, this will be staple crops like rice, maize, or wheat. Um, and that's why, uh, yeah, golden rice was developed. So they could increase the amount of vitamin A in the grain and hopefully fight against vitamin A deficiency. So what this means is if we could understand why there's this massive upregulation in melons, this would be quite useful because we might be able to use that information to improve our crops. So scientists were interested to do this. So they looked at the changes between these two um, yeah, varieties of melons and tried to figure out what the difference is in their genome. And they found that it was due to a single gene, um, which is quite cool that a single gene is responsible for this this yeah, big difference in the melon flesh color. And this is kind of reminiscent of what we talked about earlier with um, IE color being responsible by a single gene, the, the HERC2 gene. So yeah, we also have a single gene being responsible for this difference in flesh color. And the scientists quite um, inventively named this gene orange because it makes the plant go orange. Um, and when they looked at uh, the DNA and tried to look at what was the difference between these two alleles or these two genetic variants of the orange gene, they found it was due to a single uh, letter, a single base pair difference. So in the green flesh melon, you have G because G is for green. And in the um, orange flesh melon, you have A because A is for orange. Um, and that's kind of similar to what I talked about earlier with the, uh, yeah, the single base pair difference in um, eye color. So I think it's quite cool how you have these similarities. Um, and I think it's really, really interesting that a single uh, base pair difference produces such a striking difference uh, especially considering Mellon's genome is 400 million letters long, which is 80 times the size of Harry Potter. Um, but like, yeah, I, I think when I first learned about that, it really surprised me uh, that one letter difference does create such a big difference. But if we go back to our recipe analogy, we can think of it in this way. So here's the recipe to make bread. So uh, we mix flour, yeast, salt, uh, and water into a dough, and then we bake it in the oven and we make white bread. Uh, but if we change the single letter in this recipe, such as this S, in salt, and we changed it to M for malt, uh, suddenly we're now making a completely different recipe, you see. We're putting flour, yeast, malt, and water together, and we're going to make something like a uh, lo malt loaf. So we can kind of see this um, as, yeah, analogous to what's happening with uh, Mellon's genome, where if you have this, um, this G here, you have the green flesh, but if you change this single letter, you have this orange flesh melon. So um, when we look in um, plants, or yeah, all plants, they all have a copy of this orange gene, and this is because all plants are evolutionary related. So they all have, um, yeah, a copy of orange. And this is kind of similar to how, uh, I guess, for our eye, eye color, um, yeah, between different mammals and stuff, we'll have similar genes to do with eye color. I don't know where I was going on that one. But yeah, the point is there's orange genes in a lot of different plants. So when we look at the DNA sequence of these different genes, we actually see this G in this position. And if you remember, the G produces the green flesh melon, um, and it's only in melons and the orange flesh melons that we see this A. So um, we can kind of think of this in recipe books again. Sorry, I keep going back to this analogy. Um, so yeah, we have many different recipe books and 
let's say they all contain a recipe for bread, um, such as they all contain the orange gene. Now, in the recipe for bread, they all have the same flour, yeast, salt, and water. But if we made this, um, this mutation, we changed the S to an M, now they're all going to be making a kind of multi loaf. So the question is, um, if we change this G to an A uh, in the other orange genes of other plants, do we also see this increase in carotenoids? Because that would be really important for human health and it could help us improve our crops. So um, that was a question. And uh, when people looked at that, they did find that, that did happen in other species. So for example, here's tomatoes and here's the developing tomato. And when you had this uh, A copy um, that produces the orange flesh inside the tomato, you see, uh, you can't see it that clearly on this board, but they go yellow. Um, earlier on so these are a bit more green as they're developing and if we cut one of them open the the yeah normal orange gene is green but the other one makes it go slightly more yellow because you have an increase in carotenoids so there's always this question of can we do this in a staple crop so um yeah i work on wheat so that's what i'm going to be talking about uh so yeah so so how do we do this how do we make this um, single letter change this g to an a and i guess the obvious uh, answer would be something like crispr uh but the problem is, as I talked about before, CRISPR is a targeted mutagenesis technique. So um, it creates a break in the DNA and that creates a random mutation. So we can't really specify what we want. We can't say change it from a G to an A. So if we did try and target this, we'd probably um, create a mutation, knock out some DNA letters, and that would be it. So it's not really ideal because, again, we want this G to an A uh, mutation. So... I've been using a technology called prime editing, which is a kind of more advanced version of uh, CRISPR. And it has a couple changes. Um, so you still have a target sequence, but you also have a template sequence. And this is uh, what you want the change to look like. So I think the best way to think of this protein is the find and replace tool in Microsoft Word. So you give it a sequence um, that you want it to find, and then you give it another sequence that you want it to replace that sequence with. So it'll come along, scan along the genome, it will then find um, that sequence you've given it and it will make your little uh, DNA change. And there you go, you've made the edit in the genome. So um, the question is, can we do that? And then does that increase vitamin A in wheat? So if we just take a step back, I think um, it's quite cool to look at what we're trying to do here in terms of the size of the wheat's genome. So wheat has 17 billion uh, bases or 17 billion letters in its genome. So it's a very, very big recipe book. Um, and if we were to print out that whole genome on A4 paper, double-sided, it would be uh, 5.4 million sides. Um, and if we stacked that up on top of each other, it would stretch to 245 meters, which is two and a half times Big Ben or four of the Norwich City buildings stacked on top of each other. So it's a really, really big genome. And it's actually 5.6 times the size of uh, the human genome. Like wheat's just crazy how big the genome is. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to take one of those, uh, one of those sheets out of this stack and change a single um, a single letter, a single base in that sheet, and hopefully have a change to, yeah, the amount of vitamin A. Um, and every single time you grow wheat, you have natural mutations introduced into the genome at random. So um, it's, yeah, a couple hundred natural mutations every time you grow it. So all we're trying to do is we're trying to have one more mutation uh, where we want it. And that's what we're kind of doing with gene editing. Um, so the next question is, did it work? Which is quite an important question. Um, so I went ahead, did the science, and I did the CRISPR, grew up the plants, and I ended up, this is how we do like, yeah, the plant CRISPR in the lab and ended up with loads and loads of plants. Um, and the next question was to, to look at that and to screen it. And it turns out DNA is really, really small. So I couldn't see it with my naked eye. So I um, I did some sequencing with uh, Daniela. Thank you, Daniela. Got to put a thanks up there, but yeah. Um, and then the question is, did I find any edits in all that sequencing? And the answer is no, no, I didn't. Um, so I had to throw away all my plants and I've decided never to eat melons uh, ever again. Uh, and it's quite sad, but like in science, sometimes it'd be like that. Like you try to do something new and sometimes it works and that's great, but sometimes it doesn't. So I kind of come to terms with that. And it's not too surprising because the technology, this prime editing technology, the technology is still really, really quite new. And since I started the project and designed all the, the ways to make this mutation, loads more papers came out and said, no way, these are some improvements, this works. But by that time that these papers had come out, it was kind of too late. I was too far gone down trying the other one. So um, at the moment now, it does look like it is quite efficient uh, with the last paper. Uh, and you can get this technology working in wheat, which is really exciting because it allows us to do a lot of, uh, yeah, lots of new gene editing things. Blech, things. Anyway, um, I think what this what this like project does kind of show is where the future of gene editing technology can be. So we've identified a natural mutation um, from, from melons 
And this is just through natural diversity. Uh, we then thought, okay, with gene editing, let's try and introduce that to our crops. And hopefully we'll have a improvement in some agronomic traits like nutrition. So I think what's important to note is that, yeah, natural diversity and natural variation is where all the answers are. So um, with gene editing, we're kind of using things that we learned about from nature to improve our crops. But yeah, the really important thing is the diversity and is yeah protecting our biodiversity. So yes, that's been my talk. Here's a summary. Um, I again, uh, I described like hopefully described GM uh, and gene editing uh, through this kind of yeah recipe book idea. Um, I also want to know, oh, I want to make point, like you shouldn't fear mutations. Uh, mutations are what makes natural variation and natural variation is good because that's how we can uh, breed new crops and improve our plants. Uh, so for example, we have the example here again. Um, also increasing vitamin A content of our staple crops would help fight vitamin A deficiency, which would be quite good. Uh, and gene editing will help improve our crops in a really targeted manner. So that's been my talk. A big thank you to everybody in my lab, as well as my supervisors, Wendy and Noam. And a big thank you to everybody at John and us who's kind of helped. Um, so like, yeah, horticultural services growing up the plants. It's just like fantastic that we can grow up plants and have them being like automatically watered here at the John and us. And everybody in my lab, like, yeah, helping me throughout my PhD. It's been really great. So yes, that's been my talk. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to make a decision that we're not going to have questions. So apologies to everybody in the room and online. The school's uh, time is ticking for them. Yeah, no worries. Um, if you wanted to ask me questions, you'd come at the end. Yeah. Brilliant. Great, okay, Josh. That was excellent. Right. Without much further ado, I'll introduce um, Professor Ben Garrett. I need to read my notes because I've not heard of him before. So Ben is from Norfolk originally, but he is currently um, Professor of Evolutionary Biology and Science Engagement at the University of East Anglia. He is a man for all seasons, and I will let him explain why. Thank you. I just want to quickly go over some of the talks we've already heard. I always think it's worth taking a, a take home message. I kept thinking, what are my take home messages from the four previous talks? And Jim, it was all about transferable skills. If you can pour a pint, you can basically do science. It's a really big lesson there. I worked in bars for years. so I really resonated with that. Lizzie, I love the fact we got to know your pets. And had I known that was the case, I would have listed all of my dozens of rescue chickens and cats and dogs. So I, I love that we've got scientists and real people as well. Lewis. I do have to say that just because something hits its 40s, it is not referred to as dilapidated and needs knocking down. <laughs> Although I did resonate with that as well. And where are you, Josh? I love your explanations. Just did science and because evolution, I'm gonna start using those explanations. As complex as your stuff was, it was evolution. Sometimes just cut through all the, all the waffle. I love it. And there's some really good talks today. And we're already seeing that there are lots of different people involved in lots of different areas of science. So a little bit about me very quickly. I do, I work at uh, UEA, but I live in Bristol. I am backwards and forwards all the time. So I'm an evolutionary biologist. I specialize in human evolution and work a lot across Western Africa now, especially, and look at chimpanzees, gorillas, the relationship between them and us. I look at their mental health. I look about look at their conservation um, efforts going into trying to save them. I've worked with their ecology. Um, but also work with a whole bunch of different species in different places around the world. As Andrew said there, I grew up in Norfolk, very, very proud to be a Norfolk boy. Um, and, oh my God, I was weird growing up. I was such a strange child. I'm a weird adult, but I was like a weird child. I really was. And I think that's something we need to celebrate as well, being weird. I mean, I, I would like to think there's nobody normal in this room. Um, I don't need hands up, but equally don't try and be normal, especially if you're listening. You don't want to be normal. It's just boring. Status quo is crap. Um, I was so weird that, uh, that I go full circle now. I hated sports as a child. This whole concept of being competitive never resonated with me at all. When I used to, I was made to play football, the inhumanity of that, I was made to play football and I used to pass it to my mates on the other team and, and get absolute shout at that. Um, but the one thing I wasn't too bad at was cross country running, but I didn't like it because I was really good at it. And I got put into county runs and championships where I'd equally go slowly just so they wouldn't put me in the next season's run. And one of my favorite moments 
Um, my early sporting days was we were doing a cross-country run on the beach in February. Again, it's brutal, isn't it? It really is. Um, and I found a big dead shark that just washed up. And like any normal 13-year-old, I put it over my shoulder. It was like a six and a half foot taupe. So I was enthused. I was like, right, that's going over my shoulder because what teacher won't be enthused? I take that back to class. And I can just remember my PE teacher chasing me down the beach, uh, effing and blinding at me. Um, but he couldn't catch me. <laughs> Sucker. Um, got back to school, thought my science teacher would be over the moon. I got detention. Um, still had a big dead shark in my hands. Um, and I was that kid where she, I, I completely, I must have, looking back, gave someone a challenge they didn't understand how to do. I said, we can dissect this later, miss. And clearly she'd never dissected a shark. And I clocked onto that and asked if that was the reason she was so angry. It went horribly wrong, escalated really quickly. And she did that classic thing. Well, if you think you can do it, why don't you? So, Thank you, took the scalpel. I was that kid, I was awful. And I wanted to be a medic for years. I really was obsessed that I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a medic, and I worked in a, in a mortuary for, for all the way through college. Again, I was told you I was weird. Um, really enjoyed my time there, ironically. Um, but it didn't resonate. I just didn't like what I did because it was in a white room with white ceilings and white floors and white walls. The work I did was fascinating, and it was what really appealed to me as a scientist, this sense of exploration and problem solving and almost like being a detective. Uh, it's very childlike to say that, but us scientists, we are solving problems and delving into mysteries. But I didn't want to be in a white room and we shouldn't all want to be the same sort of carbon cutouts of each other and, and what works to be a scientist. And for me, it was, I went home one day and I said, I just want to work in green. I want to be around green stuff and go to, go to far fun, fun far flung places and do these wonderful things. I didn't know how to do this. And my mum said something that completely stuck with me ever since. It was just go and try things. What's the very worst that can happen? Which is a massive thing to say to someone young growing up or to any of us who aren't so young anymore, but this concept of changing and just trying things. And nobody goes to an all you can eat buffet. I mean, going to an all you can eat buffet is, is disaster anyway, but you never eat just the first thing you see and just have a massive pile of that first dish. Otherwise, what's the point of going? And I think our careers in science are a little bit like that. And actually hearing from some of you today, we've all got these circuitous routes that we've come into science. And we should celebrate that because we've found our way, we've found our passion. If we haven't found our passion yet, it's still never too late. My oldest undergrad started at 74. She's my favorite ever undergrad. She was amazing um, and completely inspired me and understood, helped me understand that it really is never too late. So as Andrew said, I now work at UEA, but I also um, uh, write science books for kids. I work on TV. I do work with some famous faces, such as Attenborough occasionally, um, and do lots of radio work as well. Because I think engaging science and working with a wider audience I say the word audience and it sounds showbiz, but you're an audience right now. My students are audience. We're all an audience on different levels, but working with a broader audience to help engage science is one of the most important things, at least for me, I think we can do as, as scientists. But I'm here today to talk about science for all, making science more than scientists. I've got a lot of friends who are teachers and heads and, and deputies around the country and quite a lot in the Norfolk area. And I went and gave a talk really pretentiously um, to a school just outside Yarmouth a few years ago. And I had this amazing PowerPoint of all the places that I'd been, the Arctic and dive with tiger sharks and working in the Caribbean and polar bears and, and gorillas and orangutans. And I did a little slideshow of all the different animals for the kids to guess where they were and inspire them. They could do anything. And to start with, I sort of onboarded them gently and said, right, what's this animal? Spiky animal, about this big, waddles around at night. Not a single kid knew what it was. It's like, oh, that's, that's weird. Okay, well, it's a hedgehog. We'll try the next one. Big stripy thing. Badger. Didn't know what badger was. And this was really scary and really hit me. It's like, why am I trying to show these kids things that are from around the world? And they couldn't identify what these animals were. I mean, most of them knew what a fox was. None of them, I think, I think maybe one or two had seen a fox. Fewer than 50% of that group who lived just outside Great Yarmouth had ever been to their local beach. And that was really scary. So we completely tossed away the whole of that lesson and just worked on what it means to be a scientist, what it means to be part of your local environment. Then I suddenly clicked and I thought, right, okay, let's do the whole thing. Draw a scientist. And they all drew 
an old white guy with crazy fuzzy hair in a lab coat. And yes, they exist, and I've worked with a few of them, and they're great. But if I look around here right now, I can't see him. He's not in here. He might be. I just can't see him. But look, we're all scientists. We all work with science in different ways and, and shapes and forms. That should be reflected. And the next question that really scared me, my mate, who's the, the head there, uh, asked, she said, how many of you think you're allowed to be scientists when you get older? None of the girls thought they could be scientists. None of the boys thought they were able to be scientists. That's terrifying. That doesn't reflect on those kids or their families or even the school. That reflects on scientists and our scientific community. We need to be more open. And when we talk about things like the pandemic, we've had that talked about today a few times and how, how enabling it was for the scientific community to come together. What we really needed to do as well is to onboard the other community, to onboard the other audience, because of all the anti-vax stuff and all the anti-COVID isn't on the naive audience and isn't their arrogance or ignorance. It's because we don't onboard people. And as a, as a scientific community, we've had a really good run of science belonging to scientists. And that needs to change massively so. So that's a real pet project of mine. So I really want to work on working through that a little bit. So had you known me a few years ago, I was a, probably drank a little bit too much, definitely ate too much, definitely didn't uh, run at all. I, I wouldn't even run for the bus or the tube. My mentality was like, c'est la vie. There'll be another one in seven minutes. I'm not running for no tube. And then, <laughs> then I hit my 40s, wherever he is. And thought, right, I either need to be knocked down and replaced by a newer version, or I need to get fit. So I kind of had some sort of midlife crisis, and I thought, I can't afford a Porsche, so I'm going to just start running. So I started running about four years ago, and now I run ultramarathons. And I did this one recently. I did it last month. I ran from North Wales to South Wales over six days, which is why I'm still wearing trainers, because my to toenails are in the middle of divorcing me right now, and they're all slowly leaving uh, my body. So... <laughs> And I thought about this on this run. I thought, oh my God, I'm so good. All the way through, yeah, Ben, you're amazing, incredible. But after that, which I didn't believe in the slightest for very long, it really hit me of how many people had enabled me to do that run. So I think a lot of us have this sense of imposter syndrome. I'm not gonna ask for hands up, but I can't imagine there are many people in this room who don't get imposter syndrome. And actually, weirdly, the better you are at something sometimes, the more you get it. I get complete imposter syndrome. Every time I'm on TV, I can't, cannot watch myself on TV because I do not belong there. Every time I write a kid's book, I never read it again because I shouldn't be writing that kid's book. And I still feel that, that. And it's ridiculous. But I got imposter syndrome day three running over Wales. Like, it's not a good time to lose your confidence. Because already people were going online, oh my God, that's amazing. What you do is great. You're inspiring me to be a better human. Yeah. And it made me feel sick. I was like, ooh. And it hit me. It's like, I've not done this on my own. I'm not doing it in isolation. And it sounds cliche and, oh, I'm trying to be a really wholesome person, but I'm, I'm really not like that. I'm not very wholesome at all. But it hit me that so many people had enabled me to get where I was and to achieve what I was achieving, whether it was my partner, my friends, family, colleagues. I had a team from Swansea University who every morning and night looked at my pee, my, I let them, my pee, my blood, and a whole range of different physiological outputs to help me do better and perform better and make it a part of a, a, a pilot study. And it really, it really sort of crystallized that even doing something as simple as a run on my own, going from North to South Wales, wasn't me in isolation. It was the people at the water stations, the people helping at night, feeding us as a, as a running community. And I think the science is exactly the same. So none of us do science on our own. So that's my non-science example, but when I decided I didn't want to be a doctor, um, I, I left home at 17, and like any normal 17-year-old, I moved as far away as I could from my family, and I went to Madagascar. And I really just tried to leave home. There's nothing wrong with my home life. I had a great home life, but I thought I needed to explore the world, and uh, I buggered off for a while. So I ended up in Madagascar, and then came back and did a undergraduate degree in animal behavior. And it was when I was a, I used to be a butler. <laughs> I know I don't come across the sort of person who should be quite poshly serving someone and, and not answering back, but I was silver service butler at Cambridge University because there are two universities in Cambridge, apparently. Cambridge and my one, I went to Anglia Ruskin and I used to serve the other university, the bigger one, um, and do silver service. And I met Jane Goodall one evening, my absolute hero, this amazing woman who had been working with chimps in Africa for well over 50 years at the time, who 
changed and, and revolutionized our understanding of the natural world and the species around that and our closest living relatives. And Jane was my hero. And here I was uselessly serving her soup and terrified I was going to spill her soup in my hero's lap. But in talking to Jane just by serving her soup, I ended up three months later at the end of my degree working in Uganda for several years running a massive conservation program um, that was completely holistic and this is what really hit me about this project I naively thought being a biologist I would work with biology and actually I could narrow that down because I've been sitting with Sam up there and, and Sam works in a completely terrifying part of biology to me he works with plants I do not understand plants at all. <laughs> Sorry. If it's hairy and swinging through trees, great. If it's a being swung through like a tree or a plant, I just don't know what's going on. It's just, so I knew that I wasn't going to work with plants because for me, that's much more complex biology than monkeys and chimps. So you guys who work in botany in any way, shape or form, hats off to you. I just work with the easy stuff, the, the big screaming things that uh, have tails or not tails usually. But I thought going to work in the field of biology It'd be easy because I loved animals. I understood animals. Didn't really like people very much. Great. I could go live in a forest and not have to talk to anyone. I had to talk to so many people. It was horrific because a tiny part of my work involved biology. I found out very quickly that I was also in charge of law enforcement. As a kid growing up in Yarmouth, I should not have been in charge of law enforcement. <laughs> Things went down really quickly in the middle of Uganda. Um, I was doing community engagement. I was working with uh, helping local communities change, uh, uh, change uh, employment and do different types of employment and different types of uh, careers rather than trapping uh, animals in the forest. We were doing using crafts um, to uh, redeploy their, their time and, and the way they got their money and actually even taking wire snares that were used to catch chimps, making them into little um, greetings cards that we would then make relationships with international zoos and then package them off and sell them and make these sort of microfinance projects and then reinvest the money that these local communities had made into making more sustainable agriculture. So I did end up working with plants eventually. Um, this whole idea that this suddenly as a biologist, very small amount of my time actually was with the animals here. And this is with one of our girls, this is Kiza. Kiza had lost um, use of her hand. She had a snare stuck around her hand and uh, we went in and darted her. So in that one project, you have myself, Richard, who's the vet. You had about six or seven field assistants. Uh, we had some Ugandan Wildlife Authority team members there. And what really struck me is everything we did, there was only ever one scientist around, but there's usually the 15, 20 people achieving something. And it was that whole sense of, I wanted to save chimpanzees, but that only needed one scientist. Instead, we needed field assistants and trail cutters and cooks and a whole, you name them, they were there and the local community clearly as well and educators and you name it, they were, they were on board. So this was a real short, sharp shock for me, just how important non-scientists are in doing science. I mean, the scientists, the, we're like the mascots of science. We just go along and look great and ta-da, I'm here, everybody. And yes, we do a lot of work. I'm not detracting completely from what scientists do, but we don't do everything. And that, that's an undeserved uh, accolade, I think, in many ways. So I've got a few examples where it really highlights just how different people and different, different roles are played by non-scientists in a very scientific capacity. I do a lot of um, work with different organizations, different institutes and lots of different charities. And I sit on boards for charities. and I'm patron for a bunch of others. Um, including the Youth STEM Awards, who again, Sam's here today. Uh, lots of ways of, of mixing different people to achieve that same output, to improve science and improve accessibility of science. And one thing I love is citizen science. And we are so good at that in the UK. And as the phrase citizen science suggests, it's not about scientists at all. And I've got loads of different, different examples I could have picked. My favorite is this. This is a common skate. So it's an elasmobranch, it's a fish, it's part of the skate and ray family. And these things can be huge. You're talking from that uh, podium there to about here. And we found them, or we find them around Scotland. But to actually do any marine biology, and I've done a little bit, I've, I've, I need to scratch the surface, but I've, I've, I've had a little, I've had a dabble in marine biology and I love it, but it's so complex and it's so time consuming and so costly in terms of person hours going into achieving anything. But there is 
an amazing opportunity where we have done world-leading marine biology-based research without using very many scientists at all. So the Shark Trust and the Marine Conservation Society, but mainly the Shark Trust, um, 20 years ago this year or 20 years ago last year, 20 or 21 years now, realized that they were getting loads of photos of people sending in mermaids' purses. And if you've had a walk on the beach, you find these little mermaids' purses. They're rectangular things with little projections on each corner. Um, they're not actual purses from mermaids. Mermaids use something completely different. These are egg cases from sharks and rays. And it was quite cute, people sending this thing going, hi, I found this thing, what is it? It's not a mermaid's purse, yes, it's from so-and-so. What is it? It's a mermaid's purse. It's from... So enabling people to understand what they're finding themselves is really important, but they cottoned on really quickly and said, there's a real opportunity here to engage the public and get them involved. And fast forward a few years now, they've had over 150,000 individual um, data points or pieces of feedback now or reports from the British public in terms of finding these little mermaid's purses. But more than that, you have to verify what they are. So there's a very strict criteria. So these are 150,000 or so verified reports now, or data points of people feeding back what they found. Is it a cat shark or a lesser spotted cat shark or a taupe like the one I found? Is it a, is it a poor beagle or poor beagles don't they? Um, they uh, mermaid's purses actually, but is it one of the um, different species that we have around the UK? And we have at least 13, as many as 60 different species of shark and ray around the UK. Now, until then, we thought we only had one species of common skate in, in the world, actually. It's a big, flat thing, really heavily prized by the fishing industry, um, very slow uh, maturation, um, and they're sus uh, not sustainably caught. They weren't, unfortunately. But then people start sending in these photos of these ray egg cases, and there was a real distinct difference between the different photos being sent in. And very quickly, the team said, well, that's, that's weird. There's like a regional morph or something, but they're, they're not the same. So again, long story short, they started looking into this and a bunch of other academics then did get involved and realized there are two completely separate species. You think, so what? It's just taxonomy, not to detract from taxonomists, but does it have a real application? Yes, it does, because they were found in different areas. They had different points where they bred and raised uh, and acted as nurseries for these young and slowly developing uh, rays as well. So because of citizen science, because of people who aren't scientists at all, people who are going for a walk on the beach, we helped identify there's a whole new species out there that we hadn't seen before. And we can actually work with management plans and in conservation policy to try and change that. And that's made a difference in fisheries around Scottish waters because of kids and adults collecting things off the beach. Now, we do have some people who collect these things so regularly that they've been specifically trained now, but they're not scientists. To, if they walk their dog every day and they're finding dozens and dozens of these things, we've had them trained up as, as really accurate um, uh, research assistants now. That's brilliant. We've also got a whole range of different um, shark nurseries around the UK. Who knew we even had shark nurseries, let alone around the UK, because of our understanding of these little mermaid purses? And barely any scientists have been involved with that. And that's amazing. And Britain is brilliant at this. We Every year we do bio blitzes where people go to their local park or communal gardens or even uh, fields and, and, and green spaces such as around we have our campuses here. And they're doing 24-hour surveys and very often, there isn't a single scientist there. There might be one or two, but you have dozens and dozens of people who go every year who are collecting things, learning to identify things, and we're getting understanding of not only what's in a certain place, but what changes over time. We see the Great British Bird Watch, um, where several points in the year for an hour or so, you look out your window and you record all the birds there. It's a nice part -time, uh, uh, pastime. It's also a nice way to engage the audience, the public, but actually it's being used by the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology and the RSPB to actually look at trends in, in bird distribution and population dynamics. And if we wanted to do that scientists, we wouldn't have the time, the energy, the capacity to do this stuff. And yet by working alongside people who aren't scientists, we're getting some really good science done. I love that example. And one of my favorite examples, huh. this is Catherine. <laughs> Some of you might know Catherine, Catherine Barry. She's over at UEA. She can't unfortunately be here today, uh, though I think she is watching. Catherine, <laughs> I feel like poor Catherine has been through it with me. Because when I first started here, Catherine wanted to get involved in the stuff that I did and the outreach. And poor Catherine has, has now chopped up more things than she ever thought possible just a few years ago. 
and it's not always gone well. <laughs> uh, this is an alligator that we uh, dissected for the Norwich Science Festival. This is Dr. Jess French on my left here, just out of shot, sadly. She's a veterinary surgeon, me uh, and Catherine. Don't know the name of the gator. Um, but we, they were, it was ethically euthanized. It was part of an animal, uh, it was part of a zoological collection that had sadly um, uh, been affected by a disease. It was euthanized. We used it for, for research and for engagement. But the nice thing is, we worked with the lab techs that we have at UEA, and Catherine helped lead this, a lot of this. And what was so nice, and what has been so nice, is that we've been able to work alongside Catherine and the rest of the team, her team there, and do trading. So Catherine's gone to London Zoo to do porpoise dissections, and hopefully we're off to Edinburgh soon to do some dissections up there. And this is all for both science festivals and BBC4 radio series that we work on, as well as we now use... Um, gross anatomy in some of the teaching that we do at UEA because it's worked really well. We've also set up a death lab, which sounds horrific and it's not as bad as it sounds. Basically, we macerate things and take them down to bone and we, we do post-mortems and dissections and we're trying to get this all off the ground and, and uh, use it as a really important teaching aid. Now, that's not me doing that. Catherine is driving that and it's, it's a partnership that we've got. And if I didn't work with Catherine, we didn't work together, we would never get this off the ground. So the scientist, again, has a really small role in the output there. And what really helped me, what really, really, really made me chuckle is if you're looking at those googly eyes and thinking, idiots. <laughs> That's Catherine, first of all. But for the right reason, when we did Norwich Science Festival and we actually were in front of a big audience, we did this in the middle of the forum, in the middle of uh, Norwich, and we have several hundred kids at any one time. We did a llama a couple of years ago and had to actually ask the parents to get the kids to stand back outside the splash zone because someone was selling muffins just outside the tent. The kids were going, what's that? But Catherine suggested using the googly eyes to make us more friendly to make us more accessible, to make us less scary. It's like I'm wielding a massive scalpel chopping up Bambi. <laughs> Googly eyes aren't gonna, yeah, they help. They completely help because everyone commented on how friendly we looked that day. Um, <laughs> so working with lab techs and field assistants and the public and law enforcement and you name it, we could be here forever just naming these different, different people, these different components of the whole output that we're all trying to achieve. We're all trying to change things. No, the, I think the whole idea of being a scientist to purely study something for the sake of studying something is, is a dying art, luckily. And I think that sort of isolationist approach to science where it is just for scientists and it's just kept behind a wall is going. There aren't many like that left, really pleased to say. Instead, it's accessibility. It's helping the public understand science. I do a lot of outreach with kids, very small kids, and talk about dinosaurs. I don't always like dinosaurs, I've got to say. I mean, they, they drive me nuts a little bit, but actually it's a gateway. If kids can understand, I talk about synapsids and diapsids and pentadactyl limbs and evolutionary biology and all these weird and wonderful context-based uh, stories and, and this narrative, it's engaging a science narrative. It's onboarding science literacy. And if we've not just seen through the pandemic where science doesn't just belong to us in this room or just to those working in these amazing labs and teaching spaces we have around here, Something I hear loads is when people come to me and say, I just, I just I don't really do science. Oh, ah, okay. You're breathing, right? Yeah. Okay, you're doing science. This whole separation, there's me being flippant there. Anyone who thinks we don't do science or they don't do science is because it's not staring a test tube with some sort of crazy Bunsen burner based experiment underneath. Again, that's us that's portrayed that. And the media portrays that really badly as well. So when you go home later, please just Google scientist and Google images. It's eureka moments with crashes and bangs and explosions and singed hair. I don't work in a lab. I'm pretty sure that's not on good lab practice, first of all. But equally, that's not what science or scientists should be. And this sense of that we can onboard different people and really show that science isn't just about me and my scientific colleagues who are scientists, then that's surely a better thing. And at a time when, it's going to sound I've gone from this to out here somewhere, at a time when... 17% of British mammal species are threatened with extinction right now. Um, we've finally seen it's the hottest September ever recorded, just gone. We've got viruses coming in left, right and centre. It's not all doom and gloom here. But actually, if we're going to solve these problems and address some of these crises, 
we can't do it as scientists alone. These are global problems affecting all of us. And when we expect other people to join in, when we expect people to uptake vaccines and to not have an issue with GM food and all these things, we have that responsibility to make that happen. And the first step of that is realizing that as a community, we're not just scientists. We are all the different people in these rooms, this room right now, those listening on, online, as well as all the others, as well as every single person you see on a day-to-day -day basis or who provides the equipment or who helps grow the plants or who does any of the thousand jobs that help any of us achieve that scientific outcome. But that is not just scientists. So yeah, I think in order to sum up, Science is amazing. Science is really cool, but science isn't about scientists. Scientists, is, scientists are about the questions. I'm going to name drop. I nearly didn't name drop, but I'm going to. I was having lunch with David Attenborough one day, and um, I asked him, I said, why do you always wear the blue and the khakis? Why? He said, well, I, I don't want people to look at me. I said, okay. I mean, David's got a fairly big ego, I'm not going to lie. And he loves storytelling and he likes to be the center of attention in a lovely way because he's been doing it for so long and he's so charismatic. And he said, it's not about me. It's all the stuff that I do. You should be looking behind me. You shouldn't be going, what am I wearing today? What shoes has he got on? How's his hair? So David always, David has about nine shirts that are exactly the same. And his daughter sews a little bit of a broken shirt just underneath here to make a little sleeve where his microphone fits. And he's got about six or seven pairs of the same car keys. If Marks and Spencer ever goes bust, David's going to have to be naked. Seriously. But I love that sense. It's not about David. The most famous naturalist, the natural historian, the best nature's, the nation's granddad is all about, it's not about me. It's about the story we're trying to tell. It's about what I'm trying to show you. And that should be science as well. Scientists, science isn't about the scientists. It's about the question. And everyone, everyone who makes that question possible, or everyone who helps create that answer, they're the ones we should be looking at. Thank you very much. Um, right, I think we have got time for some questions, but don't don't drift too far away. Have we got questions online? Yeah, not yet. Have we got questions in the room? <laughs> That was a really wonderful talk. Thank you so much. In my own work, I've run into members of the public who know more about the natural history of a species than I will ever hope to know because they have the time and they have the excitement. But sometimes they say that they're not scientists because they don't have the education. For example, they see that as the definition of a scientist, someone who has a science background. What can we do to encourage people like that to think of themselves as natural scientists, natural historians, to boost their ego and make them realize that their contributions are really valuable? I think part of that is a really good question. So I think is, is for me at least, it's, try, I mean, I'm a heterosexual white male. I mean, I'm hardly breaking the barriers there. And I'm hardly changing the dynamics of what we, what we have on as, in terms of diversity. But equally, the very fact that the way I speak, the way I dress, the way I jump around stage, and I genuinely do not take myself very seriously at all, I think that breaks down barriers of what is a scientist. Scientists are these aloof, late middle-aged crazy guys with who just sit at home mixing potions all oh, that's rubbish that's 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 the invention of hollywood and and crap films but um i think part of that is, is just getting out there and actually so one of the biggest <laughs> weirdest compliments i ever had when i was trying to get a bbc series commissioned was one of the commissioners who decides yes or no where the programs get made at the end of me pitching this amazing wonderful series that never got commissioned um he said, I really like you. He said, I feel like you're the sort of person I could talk to in a pub. I probably wouldn't. I said, oh, okay. what, what do you mean? He said, well, I just, you know, like, well, I don't know what you mean. He's like, I don't, well, academic. I said, like, oh, okay. But that perception of is us and them and as scientists. And I think we need to just show that we're all scientists in this room. So do you all identify as a scientist? Good. And if some of you are like, oh, I don't, I don't know. What would it take for you to identify as a scientist? If you've trained your dog to sit, that's using animal behavior. If you make a cup of tea in the morning, that's that's the chemistry involved in, in mixing different things. And it's, it's yes, it's me, but it's those little steps. I think that's really important. So I think the more we do it, the more we normalize doing science and this sense of 
science isn't just for me. Science is for every single person who does anything. The moment you think about the world, the moment you think about why is the sky blue, that's a scientist. Um, and I see this with kids all the time. They say this whole sense of, I've got a really silly question. It's like, you haven't. And they'll come up with an amazing question that some of my undergrads will be looking at. And that's like, that's really cool. That's really amazing that you think that. And I think normalizing these conversations and not making that barrier of us and them and scientists and, and, and everyone else is, is just a small step. But it's, you're right, it's, it's making people feel they're not stupid by asking those questions. It's okay to have fun being scientists. I think a lot of people think that science is really boring and very fact-driven. And so we're next to UEA here. UEA have got a, a, a creative writing course, mostly until they've completely gutted that department. Um, but they have got a, a, a creative writing course still. Um, but why is that separate to science? We are telling the greatest story of the universe, whether it's Brian Cox talking about how the universe was created, right through to like looking at the changing tiny sort of base codes in, 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 in making bread and all these things that you're telling stories. So I think we need to have science out there. And we, I mean, I hate the Big Bang Theory because there's a bunch of antisocial nerds who can't quite function, who've never had sex, who don't quite know, I'm, Probably getting a bit too personal there, but it's we're pushing that narrative of this is still what a scientist is. And everyone's like, it's done so well for science. Like, it hasn't. It's reinforcing stereotypes again and again and again. And, and I'm old enough to remember Ross from Friends. Ross from Friends. Friends was like a really old thing back in the early 90s. Um, it was like black and white TVs, Friends, then like TikTok kicked off. Um, but it's that sort of thing. It's like Ross from Friends was a slightly awkward guy who had a pet monkey who dug up dinosaurs, who managed to somehow pull a hot chick. And it's like, well, there's all that, that's just like, it's weird, all that sort of, I don't like it. We should just normalize it. Just normalize science um, and scientists. It's everywhere. Anyway, bit of a rant, sorry. <laughs> ben, I've got a question from one of the students at Wyndham College who are watching online. Um, do you know if the giant skate fisherman, I guess that's giant fisherman who fish giant skate, not giant fisherman. <laughs> Uh, are they helping with the research and, and the knowledge that we have of them, the fish? Yeah, so we are, I mean, again, it's an us and them. We've, that's a really good follow-up question. So the question was, are the fishermen helping with skate conservation and, and sustainability? We've demonised farmers, we've demonised fishes, uh, we've demonised whole uh, groups of people who don't fit into the narrative of, of helping. I'm helping because I'm a scientist. Everyone else, you're just making the problem. Yeah, fishermen and fishers, fisher people, um, have been decimating our waters. We're driving that as, as, the, as, the, as the consumers. They're, they're not bad people, but actually we are seeing a real sustainable uptake of people getting involved because they're livelihoods as well. So they don't want to harvest everything. So in certain situations, and Scotland's a really good example, we've had no fish zones. We've got marine protected areas. We've got catch and release of certain size. Not only is it illegal, but they are, they are, it's for their sustainability as well. So we are seeing an uptake of, of citizen science with fishers, with the farming community, and with any of those, with poachers in Africa. So yeah, we are seeing um, the, the fishing community really helping in that situation. Yeah, another one coming yep. in online. Um, it's a little bit more detailed. How can you distinguish between different mermaids' purses? Well, sharktrust.co.uk uh, and just do mermaids purse surveys it is on there it's loads but there are loads there are loads of examples i just say go to your local beach and have a look next time you don't even need to know but actually go and collect a couple as long as there's no little developing embryo in there which you sometimes see actually which is really cool so hold up to the light as long as there's nothing in um stick in your pocket don't forget to take it out because it will smell uh, several weeks later as i found out um <laughs> so gross um and you can rehydrate them if they're they've dried out and you can see there are some that are really dark black with striations that are quite uh quite simplistically built it looks like and others are these beautiful tendrils that are pale brown some are long and thin the skate ones are about this sort of size they're absolutely monstrous um, so they all have different colors patterns sizes shapes um, but once you get your eye in there's a really nice ways and again as working in a situation where we can link science with well, scientists, with non-scientists, we have to give the the ability, the the capability, the 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 potential for you to help in that respect. But once you get your eye in, there's, there's a million different ways. Um, and the same with bird watching, the same with biodiversity surveys in gardens. It's, it's we have to provide the resources, but then you get your eye in, and and you'll really quickly know the difference between a, a small cat shark and a, and a flapper skate and a thornback gray. And a, yeah, you've never lived unless you've found a mermaid's person identified it. 
Great. Oh. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have been educated, informed, and entertained, and that's as much as I can ask for. I really enjoyed it. Um, before you all go, I would like you to say a big thank you to the committee and everybody involved to put this together today. Um, some mentions to Paige and Ruby from the respective comms teams from the Quadrum and um, John Innes, who've been tweeting out as we've gone through the day. And, and they always get forgotten, Rupert in the AV room at the back. So thanks to all the speakers, everybody involved in lunch and the displays and posters, to our sponsors, John Innes Centre and the Technicians Commitment. Thank you for coming today and joining us in what I think was a fantastic event. Thank you very much.